anniversary of the interstate highway system. And that's our program lineup today. Next, White House access to FBI files. Last week, the House Government Reform and Oversight Committee heard testimony from Craig Livingstone, former White House Personnel Security Office Director, Bernard Nussbaum, former White House Counsel, and Anthony Marcisa, who handled the collection of FBI files. Republican Congressman Bill Klinger chaired the hearing. A programming note, today we'll show you the first three hours of this hearing. The second portion will air tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern, here on C-SPAN. Well, the members of the media will clear the well immediately. Get them out of there. They're still hanging around there. Harder hearing. They're still in the well. They can leave the room. I'm going to give you about one more second, then I'm going to ask all still photographers and television cameras to leave the room. Mm -hmm. Well, we got to do something. Do we have the starting the room? All right. In our hearing last week, we learned how the very sensitive matters of confidential background checks and security clearances were handled by prior White Houses, both Democrat and Republican. In the past, serious, circumspect, and highly responsible people were put in charge of these most sensitive matters, and for good reason. Last week in our hearing, we also learned the care and process that was followed in order to ensure the confidentiality of these sensitive files. We also learned that this work was not handed over to political operatives or detailees from other agencies, and certainly not to 18-year-old volunteers or interns with no security clearances. The White House is at the center of policies and debates that may determine matters of life and death, war and peace, uh, and for the past 30 years, the White House has engaged in a careful process of security clearances and background checks on individuals to determine their suitability and stability for positions at the White House and throughout the executive branch. The clearance and background process is designed to protect the security of the president as well as the national security of the country. One only has to recall the case of Aldrich Ames to realize what kind of problems can arise from a lack of vigilance in security matters. But as important as it is to have good procedures in place to guard against breaches of security, the people who operate such procedures must be carefully selected and above reproach. There also must be supervision and accountability in such a sensitive process. As the Washington Post uh, editorial, uh, chief editorial writer Meg Greenfield pointed out in a uh, column this week, quote, even if the accident rationale holds up, it was a plenty serious and inexcusable accident. Neither that material nor that responsibility should ever have been placed in those hands, close quote. So why did the president allow a political operative with a dubious background to hire a fellow political operative with a dubious background to conduct this most sensitive work. Wasn't the president troubled by the fact that 18-year-old interns and volunteers without security clearances had access to the most sensitive files of his staff as well as the 400 or more files of foreman, former Reagan and Bush officials? It is extremely troubling to think the president could allow his staff to so cavalierly handle security matters. Now we learned that Mr. Marcisa left the White House with computer disks, which included analyses of the confidential files of National Security Council staffers and other White House employees. The full count of the number of files that were requisitioned and removed from the FBI keeps mounting. How was it that despite the frequent turnover in the Council's office, Mr. Livingston retained his position as President Clinton's head of White House security throughout this period. 
As we all know, with management turnovers come job shuffles. And are we to believe that former counsels Mr. Nussbaum, Mr. Cutler, Judge Mikva, and the present White House counsel Jack Quinn all thought Craig Livingston was the best man for this sensitive job at the White House? In the spring of 94, when the problems and delays in obtaining White House passes and security clearances came to light, Mr. Kennedy was relieved of his responsibilities in this area, but not Mr. Livingstone. And then in August of 1994, Senator DeConcini, the Democratic chairman of the Treasury Postal Appropriations Committee, which provided funding for the White House, was rebuffed when he wrote to the President to suggest detailed changes in the Personnel Security Office which would have involved replacing Mr. Livingstone with a career professional with a security background. Who is Mr. Livingston's patron, if any, and why is he still to this day on the public payroll, despite having made what everyone says were inexcusable mistakes, and despite having a total lack of experience for this very sensitive security job? Mr. Nussbaum has testified in a sworn deposition to this committee that he does not know who hired Mr. Livingstone, although he has suggested the Chief of Staff's office may have been involved. Before joining this sensitive White House post, Mr. Livingstone worked with the President's Hollywood friend, Harry Thomason, as the Director of Security for the Clinton inaugural. Mr. Livingstone's supervisor, Mr. Kennedy, has said he cannot shed any light on who hired Mr. Livingstone and noted that his superior, Mr. Foster, didn't know much about him either. Mr. Livingstone has told the committee that he does not know who recommended him, although ABC News reported last week that Mr. Livingstone told them that he was hired by Bill Kennedy. And while those who previously heaped high praises on Mr. Livingstone, such as the President's senior advisor, George Stephanopoulos, they now virtually deny knowing him at all. And the White House remains silent even as we learn more and more troubling facts about Mr. Livingstone and the person he brought in to assist him with this sensitive matter, matter Mr. Marcisa. It is now known that both of these individuals had extensive histories as campaign advance men and political operatives. Mr. Marcisa was handpicked by Mr. Livingstone for this position and requested by name by Associate Counsel Mr. Kennedy we have been provided a sworn statement from a former Gary Hart campaign consultant who came in contact with the Craig Livingstone and Anthony Marcisa in 1918, 1984 through the Hart campaign. Uh, Dennis Casey states that both Livingstone and Marcisa endorsed the utilization of personal information to manipulate support for their candidate. Just last week, we also learned that Mr. Livingstone was working at the White House uh, while he was working at the White House, other complaints were made about him. In addition, the accounts that these two individuals have given the committee about the requisitioning of these files and the use of various lists to do so do not appear to square with sworn testimony provided by the FBI, the Secret Service, and a former veteran employee of the Security Office, Nancy Gemmell. The Bush and Reagan officials whose files were made available to these individuals have every reason every reason to be concerned about who was minding the store. As FBI Director Free indicated in his report on this matter, the process has always relied on good faith and honor of those involved. Today we will see what happens when, instead of good faith and honor, we have political operatives, incompetence, and even teenagers uh, involved in this process. The fact is, given the individuals who were put in charge of this office and the apparent lack of any supervision or control, we may never be able to determine what exactly was done with these files. But we do know that this White House had a history of amateur detectives rooting around for dirt long before the recent FBI file flap and long before we knew about Mr. Livingstone and Mr. Marcisa. Item, in March 1993, Harry Thomason, and Darnell Martins started trying to dig up information, dirt, on the White House Travel Office and telling David Watkins and individuals in the White House Counsel's Office that the Travel Office employees were, quote, on the take. The Counsel's Office initiated contact with the FBI to spur a criminal investigation based on these allegations. Item, in May 1993, a memo apparently from someone in David Watkins' office was written directing 
Peter, last name not known, to spy on the travel office employees on a presidential trip to California, which occurred just days before the May 19, 1993 firings. This Peter was instructed to record all actions of the travel office employees on this trip. Item, during the White House management review, contrary to previous representations by the White House, the White House was looking into the allegations of wrongdoing by the travel office employees and even sought out the personnel files of all seven travel office employees. These personnel files were reviewed by Mr. John Podesta, who conducted the management review, and they were then passed on to the council's office where they stayed until the personnel director raised concerns that these sensitive files should not be floating around. The documents that this committee has obtained over the past year demonstrate that the White House was engaged in an effort to provide as much damaging information about Billy Dale and his colleagues to both investigators and the public while simultaneously shielding documents that they had relating to his chief accuser, Mr. Harry Thomason. The White House even sent a representative from the council's office to monitor Billy Dale's trial, uh, which occurred last fall. Finally, a very disturbing email from the FBI suggests or indicates that the Justice Department attorneys involved in the Billy Dale case told FBI agents that they wanted to, quote, do the indictment, close quote, of Mr. Dale, quote, before the 1994 elections, close quote. Since when do indictments hinge on election dates? In this context, the difficulty this committee has faced in obtaining documents and the White House's reluctance to produce documents in a straightforward manner has only increased our skepticism, our suspicions. The receipt by this committee of the White House's December 20th, 1993 request for Mr. Dale's FBI file, seven months after Mr. Dale had been fired, obviously raised red flags and I think legitimate skepticism. Why did the White House withhold this document for so long? Why did the President claim executive privilege over this document? Who knew Mr. Dale's file had been improperly requested and when did they know it? And why did it take a threat of contempt jailing uh, of his White House counsel for the President to turn over this document? The initial responses from the White House were as usual, I have to say, less than candid. It took several days before the White House put out the story that the requisition of Mr. Dale's file was part of a far larger request that the FBI has now deemed, quote, without justification. Whether or not these events turn out to be a blunder due to the colossal incompetence of those the President put in charge of these highly sensitive matters, or whether it veered into something darker, more serious, the casualness with which this White House has approached many areas of security and sensitivity provided a climate for either of these troubling alternatives. And the tooth-pulling recalcitrance and half-truce constantly engaged in by this White House not only make it more difficult to determine the facts. As the Washington Post noted, the damage was done on day one when the President made such poor staff choices or has to take responsibility for their having been named. The Wall Street Journal recently observed, quote, three years of evasions, half-truths, sudden discoveries of documents, and Mr. Livingston's romp uh, through exposed FBI files should tell us that the Clinton White House no longer deserves the benefit of the doubt. We may never know who hired Mr. Livingston, but his modus operandi can no longer be dismissed as an aberration in an otherwise straightforward administration. And the chair now recognizes the ranking minority member uh, for an opening statement. Um, before I do that, I want to include the depositions of Mr. Nussbaum, Ms. Wetzel, Mr. Livingstone, Mr. Marsika, and Mr. Kennedy in the record at this point. So ordered. And now I'm pleased to recognize the gentlelady from Illinois, Mrs. Collins, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I commend you on holding today's hearing. We on the Democratic side of the aisle are as committed as you are to getting to the bottom of this matter, and today's hearing is appropriate oversight. As I said at our last hearing, it was dead wrong to request FBI files on individuals who had worked in previous administrations and no longer held passes to the White House. We, along with those former employees and the public, deserve to know what happened, 
how it happened, and why it happened. Before I continue my opening statement, however, let me comment on the recent, yesterday in fact, compromise reached between the committee and the White House concerning the committee's subpoena for travel office documents and the contempt citation of White House Counsel Jack Quinn. Under our agreement, certain documents were removed from the committee's request at your suggestion. The remaining documents will now be available for the review of the members and committee staff. I am pleased that we reached this com compromise. As our dissenting views on the contempt citation noted, when there is a disagreement between the two branches of government over documents, it is imperative that both sides seek to reach an accommodation that recognizes both the need of the Congress to know and the need of the President for confidentiality. The compromise we achieved yesterday found that balance and will assure the American public that every stone is being turned to determine whether there is evidence of wrongdoing. We have also agreed that if any documents relate to the FBI files matter before us today, we will immediately be, they will be immediately be subject to public release. So this permits all of us to work toward the proceeding of, in this investigation in the bipartisan spirit that resulted in yesterday's compromise. At last week's hearing, we learned a number of relevant facts about the FBI files. We learned that it was standard practice for each administration to engage in what is now known as the update project. That is, the recreation, the recreation of personnel security files for holdover employees from the previous administration. This was required because each administration removes all of its files when it leaves office. We also learned that the procedure for requesting files was to use a pre-printed Xerox form with the name of the White House counsel typed at the top but requiring no signature. These forms date back for 30 years to the Johnson administration. This procedure was, as the FBI found, ripe for abuse, and it now appears that these forms were improperly used to obtain the FBI files on former employees. The White House has taken unprecedented steps to change these procedures and bring accountability to the process, but the files were already requested. Our witnesses last week could only speculate on the reasons for what happened. A common theme expressed by Mr. Gray and Ms. Gimmel was that the use of detailees and interns with insufficient background in security or name recognition was a key problem. I agree. Security rate work is extremely sensitive, but there appears to have been an extremely lax attitude in the treatment of FBI files. So I'm hopeful that Chuck Easley, an official with 20 years' experience in security matters in the Army, and a security official in the executive office of the president since the Reagan administration will change this office now that he has been placed in charge. Today's hearing should provide more detail on how these files came to be requested and whether the requests were a result of a mistake or political activity. As the chairman has stated on several occasions, we're all interested in where the list came from, which was used by Mr. Maseka, to request the FBI files. One important witness today is Ms. Lisa Wetzel, who was the first to discuss that Mr. Marsesa had requested, quote, too many files, end quote, meaning those no longer employed by the White House. Ms. Wetzel notified her supervisor, Mr. Livingstone, of that fact and proceeded to determine which of the files involved employees no longer working in the White House. Although the files should have been returned to the FBI, they were boxed and apparently indexed and placed in the White House archives where there is no evidence they were seen again, with the apparent exception of files for active employees mistakenly placed there. Ms. Wessel's testimony is extremely relevant because she has stated that when she worked on the update project after Mr. Marsesa, she requested a secret service list of employees holding active passes. In her view, the list was out of date and required cost checking with offices. She also recalls seeing an out-of-date Secret Service list which she believes was requested by Ms. Gimmel and used by Ms. Gimmel to prepare requests to the FBI and that the list may have had the names of Marlon Fitzwater and James Baker. So we're still a long way from knowing what happened in this case and we will likely have much confusing testimony by the day's end. However, it is noticeable that to date we have received no evidence that any individual directed any other individual to knowingly collect information of employees no longer serving in the administration or to disseminate damaging information. While the mere requesting of FBI files on former employees was wrong, 
These are the questions that we must get answers to. Mr. Chairman, while it's certainly appropriate to be engaging in today's fact-finding hearing, I hope that we will also work together to explore the larger issues we have begun to uncover. For example, is it really necessary for any administration to have a set of FBI files on the premises of the White House? We know that each administration does this, but is it really proper and necessary? Second, we have been told that each president retains all of the White House files after the term is over, including the security files. Is that appropriate? Should researchers at the presidential library ever have access to such security file information? I don't think so. But anyway, in summary, Mr. Chairman, as we get to the bottom of this case, let us also take the time to see whether many of the policies that have been in place for many years with respect to security files make any sense. If we can resolve to improve the privacy of rights of all citizens, I will strongly support that effort and yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentlelady. As I indicated, uh, further opening statements may be submitted as part of the record or can be uh, made at the time that the member is recognized for his time under the five-minute rule. I'm pleased to welcome our panel here. I'm sure they're not happy to be here, but uh, we're happy that you are here. Uh, and uh, so it's not to, it's the custom of this committee so as not to prejudice the rights of any witnesses that all witnesses are sworn. So if you have no objection to that, I would ask you to rise and be sworn. Is the testimony you are about to give this committee the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Let the record indicate that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. And I will go to the first round of questioning. Each member will be recognized in turn for five minutes, rotating between majority and minority. And I will assume the first five minutes as soon as you turn on the Mr. clock. Chairman, I have an opening statement, Mr. Chairman, which I'd like to deliver. We are going to have all of those opening statements, Mr. Nussbaum, submitted as part of the record. But Mr. given Chairman, the, I must, I'm sorry, Mr. Nussbaum, I must uh, decline that request. The record, it will be a part of our record. Mr. But Chairman, in view of the fact that we do have a significant. Order, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, point of order. The, the general will state the point of order. At our last hearing, witnesses were allowed to give their opening statements. I think it's grossly unfair for these witnesses to be here and not allowed to be give opening statements. There are only two, four, five of them. That'll take 25 minutes. I would think that we would do that as a courtesy to them, since they have already sworn that what they're going to say is, in fact, uh, the truth and nothing but the truth. And to deny them the opportunity to give a five-minute statement, I think, is a bit much. I'm, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, yeah. uh, point of order. I will. I understand the gentlelady's uh, point, uh, and uh, my hope had been that uh, by submitting all of the uh, statements for the record, that we could expedite the proceedings. I know that there is a reason for some uh, members of our panel uh, who want to conclude this hearing as rapidly as possible, but given the uh, concerns that have been raised. Uh, uh, I will permit uh, opening statements, and Mr. Nussbaum, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. I think just slightly more, Mr. Chairman, but I'll try to make it brief. Mr. Chairman, Ms. Collins, and members of this committee, as you all know, I was counsel to the President of the United States from January 20, 1993 to April 5, 1994. Let me begin by telling you something that goes to the core of who I am and what I believe, that is the heart of the values by which I live. The very idea, Mr. Chairman, of obtaining FBI files for the purpose of digging up dirt on political opponents, the very thought, Mr. Chairman, of creating an enemies list and using secret and private government information against those individuals is abhorrent to me. It is contrary to every bone in my body. It is contrary to every ideal I have. It is contrary to the way I have lived my entire life. So let me be clear, Mr. Chairman. In the Clinton White House that I knew, there was no enemies list. There was no deliberate misuse of private government information. There was no digging up of dirt from government files to use against political opponents. If anyone, if anyone had committed such a re reprehensible act in this White House <clears throat> and had come to my attention or to the attention of the President or the First Lady, 
the individual responsible would have been thrown out on his ear and worse. Now, I realize full well, Mr. Chairman, that in recent weeks, you and I learned, and we both learned this at the same time, that during my tenure as counsel, a serious mistake, a very serious mistake, was made in the White House Personnel Security Office, which reports to the counsel's office. Apparently, because an inaccurate White House access list was provided to an employee of that security office, FBI summary background files, which should never have been requested, were obtained by that employee. That employee has sworn that the error was an innocent one, that the information he obtained was not disseminated to anyone outside of his office, that it was not used for any improper purpose. At the time this error was being made, in 1993 and 1994, I did not know it was happening, nor, to the best of my knowledge, did anyone in the counsel's office know it was happening. I know the quality of my counsel's staff. Bill Kennedy, who is sitting here today, is an individual of the highest integrity, ability, and judgment. I have the greatest respect and regard for him. If anyone in the counsel's office, particularly Mr. Kennedy, had discovered that this error was being made, it would have been halted immediately. But saying that does not excuse us. It does not excuse any of us in the counsel's office. It especially does not excuse me. This happened on my watch as counsel to the president. I was a responsible senior official. I bear full responsibility, and I accept that responsibility. When I testified before the Senate on other matters, I spoke about certain principles I try to live by when I held public office. Those principles are, do the right thing. Realize that at times your actions will be misunderstood and that you will be involved in conflict, that you will get bad press. Acknowledge your mistakes when they occur, but if you acted correctly, defend yourself. Defend yourself publicly and defend those around you in an open, honest, and forthright manner. Be principled, be consistent, and strong. And most important, worry less about tomorrow's headlines than about the judgment of history. Those are the principles I try to live by. We made a bad mistake here. It's an innocent mistake, I believe, but a bad mistake. And that mistake must be acknowledged. Those whose files were wrongly obtained have every right to be agitated, to be angry, knowing that even one person review their private FBI files when he should not have done so. I know I would be agitated if that happened to my file. I know I would be angry. It was a serious breach of privacy. And so each of those individuals whose file was examined deserves an apology. And while I know, I well know, it will not eliminate the hurt they feel, I do apologize to each and every one of them. Now, Mr. Chairman, since we are talking about errors, I know of another error that was made in connection with this matter. On June 5, 1996, three weeks ago, you held a press conference at which you handed out a printed form with my name on it, a form I had never seen. You called it a truly startling document from President Clinton's former White House counsel, Bernard Nussbaum. Minutes after your press conference ended, Mr. Chairman, a story went out over the Associate Press wire. That story was on national TV all day and in newspapers all over the country the next day. This was the way that story began. Washington, AP. Then White House Counsel Bernard Nussbaum asked for and received. Then White House Counsel Bernard Nussbaum asked for and received FBI background material on fire travel office chief Billy Dale six months after Dale was kicked out of his post, a congressman disclosed today. Nussbaum's written request turned over last week to a House committee, incorrectly states that the presidential lawyer was asking for the material so that Dale could gain access to the White House. United States Representative Rep William Klinger, Republican of Pennsylvania, suggested that the written statement might be, a, the written request might be a false statement that could be prosecuted as a felony. At your press conference, Mr. Chairman, which was widely reported... Mr. Nussbaum, I'm going to ask you to wrap it up in about two or three minutes, please. At your press conference, Mr. Chairman, which was widely reported, you were quite direct in your remarks about me. 
In your opening statement, you said, White House counsels are expected to be paragons of propriety. At the very least, you said, Mr. Chairman, there is a strong implication President Clinton's counsel acted unethically in requesting confidential background checks of a former employee. At the very worst, you said, the request may have violated the Privacy Act, which protects against improper disclosure of confidential records and information about current or former employees. So on the basis of, of a printed form, Mr. Chairman, you told the country that at best, I was unethical as White House counsel, at worst, I was a felon. The form you relied on, Mr. Chairman, has been in use for over 30 years. As the FBI's recent report on this matter says, FBI staff have long understood that the name on the form was typically not, typically not the re actual requester of the information. You could have called the FBI before your press conference to find out that eas easily attainable fact. You could have called me, Mr. Chairman. I do not know if you called the FBI before your press conference, but you certainly did not call me. You did call Billy Dale. You called him to ask whether he had ever requested access to the White House after he was let go. And then you had him stand in the hall outside your press conference so that Mr. Dale could immediately tell the press that he never requested such access. We know each other, Mr. Chairman. We had cordial dealings when I was White House counsel. And you have a reputation for decency and propriety. But you had no member of your staff call me to ask me a simple question. Did I ever request Billy Dale's FBI file six months after he was fired? Was I really trying to dig up dirt on Billy Dale when he was not being investigated by the Justice Department? Those notions are absurd on their face. They are false but no one called to ask. Nonetheless, you stood before the TV cameras to suggest to the country that I was using the FBI to dig up dirt on Billy Dale, that I was making false statements to the FBI, that I could probably be prosecuted for a felony, that I was not the paragon of propriety that a White House counsel should be. Everything you suggested about me, Mr. Chairman, in your press conference was a reckless falsehood. I know, believe me, I know all too well, Mr. Chairman, all too well that we live in an age where the politics of personal destruction reign supreme. I know, believe me, I know all too well, Mr. Chairman, we live in an age where, as my late dear friend Vincent Foster said so poignantly in his last note, ruining people is considered sport. Well, Vince is gone, so he doesn't have to take it anymore. He doesn't have to bear it anymore. I think, I certainly hope, the American people are becoming tired of vicious, unwarranted, baseless personal attacks, that they are becoming tired of the politics of personal destruction. But whether they are or not, I am. Enough is enough. So on this day, Mr. Chairman, when errors should be acknowledged and apologies are in order, while I hear you acknowledge your error, Mr. Chairman, while I hear your apology, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nussbaum. I would uh, point out you indicated that we had had cordial relationships, and I would concur with that, except I would also note that uh, early in your tenure, uh, you persistently denied me access to documents, uh, so they were cordial from your point of view, but from mine, I must say, uh, it became increasingly disturbing to me that we were unable to get documents on a wholly different matter having to do with the First Lady's health care task force, so there have been disagreements between us. Mr. I think Chairman, that I we, I think, let me, uh, the document that you refer to did have your name on it, and obviously that's one of the areas of inquiry here today as to how that could have gone out without your knowledge, without your understanding, without anything else. I think that there was uh, perhaps a breach there that uh, you should have at least had some knowledge or some awareness uh, that these requests were being made in your name. And Why now don't you I call would, me before your press conference, Mr. Chairman? Now I will recognize Mr. Kennedy for uh, any opening statement you may care to make. Mr. Chairman, I have no statement. I join, however, with Mr. Nussbaum in extending an apology to any and all individuals whose files were obtained by mistake. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, Mr. Livingstone, Thank for you, five Mr. minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll do my best. Chairman Klinger, Ranking Minority Member Collins, members of the committee, my name is Craig Livingstone. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify here today. Can you move the microphone closer, please? Yes, sir. First, I want to speak directly to each of the persons whose SBI, 
FBI background summaries were mistakenly obtained by the Office of Personnel Security. I am deeply sorry that this mistake occurred. I know at this point there is nothing I can do to eliminate your concerns completely, but I hope that what I and others have to say... I can't hear the witness. Will you pull the microphone up to you and uh, right, pull it up? They need to have the door back there closed. Mr. Chairman. Point of order. The we don't have statement. a copy of these statements. Apparently some of the majority do. Uh, why is that? We just received them. I assume that you should have received them as well. We don't have them over here. So. Well, we, we, didn't re we didn't receive them, Mr. Chairman. And someone has just given me a copy, and we're just now going to take it and have it to uh, Xerox so all of our members can have a copy of it. No one gave them to us. Well, somebody on your staff just gave me a copy, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, point of order. I, Mr. Chairman. It was, a, it was a pre printed form that's 30 years old. <laughs> well, I think we, if we can all be attentive to Mr. Livingstone, he is now prepared to present his, uh, his testimony. His attorney is holding, I believe, a number of copies which could be delivered. But bring it up. Bring it up here. Mr. Chairman, uh, I wonder if, a uh, point of order, Mr. Chairman, I wonder if you could ask uh, the witness to begin his statement over again since I will. it was hard to hear it through the microphone. Mr. Livingston, if you would uh, commence your statement again while they're passing out copies of the statement, I would indicate that no one, on, as I understand, on either side received the statement until just before the hearing. You may proceed. We will, uh, I'm going to ask you to have to ask you to summarize so that we can get it within five minutes. Uh, there are votes on it. Chairman Klinger, Ranking Minority Member Collins, and members of the committee, my name is Craig Livingston. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify here today. First, I want to speak directly to each of the persons whose FBI background summaries were mistakenly obtained by the Office of Personnel Security. I know at this point there is nothing I can do to eliminate your concerns completely, but I hope that what I and others have to say here today will ease some of your fears. To the very best of my knowledge and belief, my office requests for previous FBI summary reports on several hundred former administration staffers was an entirely innocent mistake that occurred during the routine process of creating personnel security files on everyone who had access to the White House complex. As best as I can tell, this mistake occurred simply because the pass holder list provided to my office by the Secret Service contained the names of former staffers who no longer had access to the White House complex, interspersed among the names of actual, current pass holders and others who continued to have access. As a result, it appears that Anthony Marcisa who in good faith relied on a Secret Service list of supposedly current pass holders routinely provided to the Office of Personnel Security, inadvertently requested previous reports on a number of individuals who in reality no longer had access to the White House complex. While I do not know all the details of how the update project proceeded, I want to be absolutely clear on what I do know. I was never asked to obtain, I never instructed anyone else to obtain, and I never myself sought to attain any FBI background information on any person for any improper purpose whatsoever, nor do I believe that anyone working for me ever sought to do so. Furthermore, to the best of my ability, I treated background information confidentially. I never disclosed nor asked anyone else to disclose any information contained in anyone in FBI's background file to any other person for any improper purpose whatsoever, and I have no reason to believe that anyone else in my office ever did so. To understand how this mistake occurred, I think it is essential to understand the role of the Office of Personnel Security in general, and the UPJAKE project in particular. It was not the function of the Office of Personnel Security to act in a law enforcement capacity. Physical security of the White House complex is primarily that of the Secret Service. During my tenure as its director, the principal function of the Office of Personnel Security was to coordinate the paper flow from the White House Counsel's Office, the FBI, the United States Secret Service to ensure that people who needed to have access to the White House complex had undergone a full FBI background investigation every five years and posed no problem regarding their suitability for access. It was not the role of the Office of Personnel Security to make the ultimate determination as to whether a particular individual was or was not suitable for White House access. That was the responsibility of the Secret Service and Council's Office. The Office of Personnel Security was an administrative adjunct of Counsel's Office that served principally as the liaison 
among counsel's office, the FBI, and Secret Service. My role as a director of the office was primarily administrative. One of the tasks we were instructed to perform by the people who ran the office during the Bush administration was to maintain a personnel security file in the office vault on every person who had access to the White House complex, whether that person was a holdover employee from a prior administration or a new hire by the Clinton administration. For, for new hires by the Clinton administration, the personnel security file was generated when the individual completed a standard form 86, which authorized an FBI background investigation. In an IS, IR, excuse me, an IRS waiver form, which authorized an IRS check to ensure no back taxes were owed. The information provided by the FBI and the IRS on each such person is contained in his or her personnel security file. Because all White House personnel security files from the Bush administration were sent to the Bush archives at the close of that administration, our office needed to recreate a personnel security file for each person who held over from the prior administration and who therefore continued to have access to the White House complex. For each of these holdovers, the personnel security file was recreated by obtaining from the FBI what is known as a copy of the previous report, which is essentially a Xerox copy of the summary that had previously been provided on that individual to the prior administration and which is contained in that person's personnel security file now housed in the archives of former President Bush. In addition, to recreating the personnel security files on those persons who had White House access during the prior administration and who, despite the change in administrations, continued to have a need for access to the White House complex. The update project was performed to determine whether any of these holdovers were due for their five-year periodic reinvestigation by the FBI. As I understand it, the long-standing procedure, dating back at least to the beginning of the Reagan administration, for identifying holdovers for the update project was to use a list of active pass holders generated by the Secret Service. <coughs> the mistake seems to have occurred because the Secret Service list relied upon during at least a portion of the update project contained outdated information and incorrectly identified as active pass holders many individuals who were not, in fact, pass holders, active pass holders. When the mistake occurred during the, in the fall of 1993 and early in 1994, the update project was far from being the main priority in the office. Much of our attention was directed to processing of paperwork necessary to generate permanent passes for new employees and officials of the Clinton administration. This required getting completed standard form 86 and tax check waiver forms for new hires and ensuring all forms were properly filled out, getting the forms to the FBI and the IRS, and resolving any minor issues counsel's office might ask us to resolve when the background investigations came back from the FBI. As many of you know, throughout the first year of the administration, we were understaffed because of budget cuts and overwhelmed by the paperwork necessary to get new staff members their permanent passes. Because the update project concerned individuals who had already been found suitable for access to the White House complex by at least one prior administration, it was not considered a pressing priority. It was a project that was worked on as time permitted during the course of responding to more pressing priorities. Chairman Klinger, members of the committee, I know and I accept that I bear responsibility for that mistake that occurred. I bear the responsibility because I failed to coordinate closely enough with Nancy Gimmel, who had worked in both the Reagan and Bush administrations and who began the project. And because I failed to supervise closely enough Mr. Marcisa, who picked up the project and worked on it for approximately six months, or Lisa Wilson, who completed the project. Because my attention was focused elsewhere on what I believed at the time to be more pressing priorities, I did not recognize the problem, and for that I am truly sorry. As a result, I want to be the first to announce that I am tendering my resignation from the White House effective immediately. But I also want to make clear that neither I, nor to my knowledge anyone else in the White House, participated in any kind of smear campaign or an effort to compile an enemy's list, as some have alleged or feared. It's just not true. Finally, I want to say something about me, Craig Livingstone. Over the past few weeks, I have been the object of much ridicule and suspicion because I have been active in political campaigns in the past, because I, like many others, have occasionally held part-time jobs in restaurants because of my size and physical appearance and because I'm a political appointee in the Clinton administration. Even though I did not attend the best of schools and did not have the best resume in town, I have been described as a political operative, a beefy former bar bouncer, a henchman, who is supposedly engaged in all sorts of misconduct dating back almost 20 years. These are false and unfair caricatures of who I am. 
I am proud that I have personally participated in our democratic system of government, and I have worked hard for little or no pay during political campaigns for candidates who I felt would make this country a better place to live. And I am proud to have served in the Clinton administration. I honestly believe that getting involved in our democracy is something good and decent, something that should be encouraged and not scorned and repaid with personal humiliation. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to make this opening statement, sir. Thank you, Mr. Livingstone. Uh, we are now involved in a series of votes on the House floor. I'm told there will be four votes. Uh, the committee, Mr. Marcisa, do you have an opening statement to, to make? Ms. Wetzel, do you have an opening statement? Uh, when we return, we will take your opening statements and then we'll go to the questions. The committee will stand adjourned until five minutes after the last in the series of votes commencing, which is now underway. We'll continue our coverage of this event in just a moment. Right now, some programming notes. This week on Road to the White House, remarks by Vice President Gore to college Democrats in Washington, D.C. Also, Republican presidential candidate Bob Dole speaks to VFW members in Dallas. And a look at the latest campaign ads. Road to the White House, Sunday at 7 and 10 p.m. Eastern and Pacific Time on C-SPAN, the political network of record. And every Sunday night after Road to the White House, book notes. Here's a preview. On the next book notes, Glenn Simpson reports on a corruption in American politics that knows no ideology. Sunday, he talks about the need to update our definition of corruption. It is certainly true that people don't deliver sacks of money to congressmen anymore to get them to vote one way or another. However, that doesn't mean that corruption no longer exists. Our argument is that it has taken new forms. Um, it oftentimes is legal corruption, such as um, uh, exchanging favors for campaign contributions, other insidious um, practices that have become very routine. Wall Street Journal reporter Glenn Simpson, co-author of Dirty Little Secrets, The Persistence of Corruption in American Politics. On Book Notes, Sunday night at 8 Eastern and Pacific Time. Now we'll continue our coverage of the hearing on White House access to FBI files. Republican Congressman Bill Klinger chaired this hearing. This portion lasts two and a half hours. The committee will now resume its sitting, and I will again ask the uh, members of the media to retreat and ask our panelists to resume their seats at the witness table. And I will now recognize Mr. Marcisa for an opening statement for five minutes. If you can keep it uh, to that, Mr. Marcisa, you are recognized. and members of the committee, I, I appear before you today as a witness to explain my role at the White House in the handling of the FBI background files. In mid-August 1993, I was detailed for my position as an investigator with the United States Army Criminal Investigation Division 
for the White House Office of Personnel Security. I remained in that position until February 1994. At that time, I had, and, I, and to this day, I continue to have a top secret security clearance. Let me generally describe what my tasks were. My primary task was to stay current with regards to SF-86s that had been filled out by new White House employees. A second task was to assist in staying current with other requests for access to the White House. The third task was the update project. This third assignment at the Office of Personnel Security was to recreate personnel security files on employees and officials from the prior administration who continued in their position with the Clinton administration or who continued to have a legitimate need for access to the White House complex. It was my understanding that all personnel security files from the prior administration had been sent to the Bush administration archives during the transition. In preparation for assuming my position at the White House, I met with Mr. Livingstone, Nancy Gimmel, and other staffers in the Office of Personnel Security. Yesterday you received notes of an August 9th meeting I had with Ms. Gimmel. Ms. Gimmel generally discussed with me the procedure by which I was to establish the files for White House employees and those with a need for access to the White House. Although it had a lower priority than other functions I was to perform, the update project was one of the job functions that Ms. Gimmel discussed. Through discussions with Ms. Gimmel, Mr. Livingstone, and others, I had a general sense of my responsibilities when I began to work at the White House on August 18, 1993. The procedure I employed for the update project was as follows. Generally, I worked from a set of computer lists that were, were located in the vault in the Office of, of Personnel Security. I attempted to go through the names on this list in order in which they appear. For each name, I would prepare a file folder and type a request on a pre-printed Xerox form addressed to the FBI liaison, asking for a copy of the individual's previous report. I believe, but I'm not certain, some folders may have already been typed and ready to, to uh, request previous background investigations. I also typed on the form the reason for the request to the FBI, uh, such as Access S. I sent the form requesting a previous report to the FBI without showing it to anyone else in the Office of Personnel Security. When the previous reports came into the office, I pulled the file I had created for the individual and reviewed the report to determine the date of, for the individual's next periodic reinvestigation and to determine whether there was any information in the individual's previous report that could raise a question as to the individual's suitability to have access to the White House complex. In almost every case, my basic function was to determine from the previous reports whether a new investigation was needed. If the previous report showed that a background investigation had been done within the last five years, I marked on the label on the file the date when a new investigation be needed, and I put the folder into the general file. If the previous report showed that a background investigation had not been done in the last five years, I began the task of putting together a proper file to initiate the reinvestigation process. The first step was to get the individual in question to fill out a new SF-86, which contained, among other things, the individual's express consent to allow a new FBI full field investigation. If in the process of seeking a new SF-86, I discovered that the individual was no longer employed by and no longer otherwise needed access to the White House, I simply put the individual's file what I, in what I called the dead file. Let me try to generally describe this set of lists that I worked from. It is not a document that I recall with complete precision mostly because it was a routine computer printout that was not otherwise particularly memorable. I do remember that it was a computer printout that was in the vault of the Office of Personnel Security. It was on green and white computer paper. I believe it was approximately eight inches wide. At least that is the picture I have in my mind. I recall that it was folded over and had connecting pages. I recall that it was approximately an inch thick, perhaps, and I recall the names being on the left-hand column. I do not recall identifying marks at the top of the pages, but that is not to say that such marks ex did exist. I have a memory, though not vivid, that there were other identifying pieces of information on those lists. I recall the computer printout was divided into various subgroups. As I best as I can recall, there may have been a description or a designation on the list noting that the particular office within the White House, for example, you will note there are designations in the document that I have provided that identify 
different offices by a letter designation. These include G for GSA, R for Residence, N for National Security Council, S for Staff, A, AT&T. My recollection is that such a designation may have been on the list, but I'm not certain of this fact. I also believe there were other identifying features on the list, such as a date and place of birth for each individual. On the basis of this computer printout, I, have gone, I would have gone through each department by alphabet. Thus, when my detail was finished, I had comp completed the list for a number of departments and was working my way down the staff list. I was not asked to, I did not speak to, obtain a previous report on any person for any, I did not seek to obtain a previous report on any person for any reason other than to create a current personnel security file for an individual whom I believed was properly included on the White House access list. When I obtained copies of the previous reports, I processed each one in accordance with the procedure I described above. I did not single out any person for uh, special scrutiny or treat any person differently because of who, who he or she may have been. I'd be pleased to answer questions at this time. Thank you, Mr. Marcisa. I would now recognize Ms. Wetzel for any opening statements she may have. Ms. Collins, good afternoon. I was employed at the White House Office of Personnel Security beginning in June 1993 as a White House intern. In August 1993, I became a staff assistant in the Office of Personnel Security and was promoted to executive assistant in the fall of 1994. I left that office in September 1995 and presently work for the Department of the Army. All of the staff in the Office of Personnel Security at that time were located in one room in the old executive office building. Off of that room was a locked door that led into a vault that the Office of Personnel Security shared with the Office of Records Management. Others who worked in the Office of Personnel Security at that time when I began to work there were Craig Livingstone, Mary Anderson, and Nancy Gemmel. At the start of my time in the Office of Personnel Security, most of our work was focused on the paperwork for full field investigations of new White House employees. This process began with the Secret Service performing an NCIC check, which usually took less than one day. After that check, an employee would be put on a 24-hour access list to the complex. Office of Personnel Security staff would then request an FBI name check, which was initiated by sending over a pre-printed pre memo to the FBI liaison. The name check took approximately two weeks. When the name check was favor favorably returned, the individual was issued a temporary hard pass. When the name check was complete, the Office of Personnel Security sent the same pre-printed memo to FBI liaison with a request for a full field investigation. Attached to this form was a standard Form 86, which had to be completed by the employee. Much of my initial work in the office involved making sure that these forms were filled out correctly. Once the completed forms were sent to the FBI, the results of the full field investigation were sent to an associate White House counsel. Another project that was being undertaken was reconstructing the files of the many holdover employees, detailees, agency representatives, etc., who had access to the White House complex. These included permanent White House employees and those detailed to the White House from agencies. I was informed that this project was necessary because at the end of every administration, all of the security files of people with access to the White House complex are boxed up and sent to the National Archives with presidential papers. Therefore, there were no files on holdover employees and there was no way to tell when those employees needed to have the routine update of the FBI background investigation that I understood was required every five years. This undertaking was known as the Update Project. I became aware of the need to do the update project from Nancy Gemmel. Nancy was the only career employee left in the office at that time, since all of the others had retired either at the end of the Bush administration or a few months thereafter. She was our primary source of information on procedures. Prior to her retirement in August of 1993, I was at a meeting with Nancy and Mary Anderson in which Nancy was giving us as much information as she could about what needed to be done and how it should be done. I do not remember exactly what she said about the update project, but I came away with a general understanding of the goals of the project. I also knew that she had started on the update project and that she had left the materials she had been using in the vault. Nancy retired at about the same time that Tony Marcisa's detail began. I did not supervise or work on projects with Tony, but, be but because we were all in one room, I had a general understanding of what he was doing. 
Like the rest of us in the office, I understood that at the start of his detail, he was primarily working on the paperwork for FBI full field background investigations of new employees. After he started, I understood that he began to work on the update project. I do not know the details of how Tony was doing the update project. I could see, however, that he was using a secret service list because of the distinctive green and white computer paper on which these lists are printed. In addition, while I knew these lists were not entirely accurate, they were the only source of information the Office of Personnel Security could work from in trying to determine the names of all the holdover employees. Tony left our office in February of 1994. For many months, no substantive work was done on the update project. I knew that Tony had left some files he had accumulated in the vault, but I did not look at them, nor was I aware of anyone else looking at them, until I began to work on the project in the late fall of 1994. When I first picked up the project, I looked at the materials that both Nancy and Tony had gathered in their work on the update project. Nancy's materials were in the vault, and they consisted of a Secret Service list and hundreds of completed one-page FBI request forms with Bernard Nussbaum's name on it. These forms were stacked in alphabetical order. When I looked at the Secret Service list she had left, I knew immediately that it was out of date. It was extremely long and appeared to contain hundreds of names from past administrations. These names were listed in alphabetical order. I do not recall that it had any indication of whether an employee was active or inactive. Although I could not be certain, it looked to me as though Nancy had attempted to complete an FBI request form for each name on the Secret Service list. I determined that these forms and the list had so many out-of-date names that they would be more work to sort through than to start over from scratch. Therefore, I threw away this list and the forms. In looking at the files Tony had accumulated, I was struck immediately by the sheer number of files. I noted that they were in alphabetical order from A to G, and the files seemed to vastly outnumber the active White House staff whose names would fall in that range. In looking at the labels on the files, I noticed many names that I did not recognize. The first name that jumped out at me was Marlon Fitzwater. I immediately concluded that Tony must have ordered previous reports for every person on whatever, whatever out-of-date Secret Service list, list he had been working from. As I reviewed the names on the labels, I also determined that Tony had accumulated many of the files that I did need. I was exasperated that I would now have to sort through a lot of useless files in order to pull out the ones I needed. At no time was I alarmed by what Tony had done. I thought he had simply made a mistake that I was going to have to clean up. The files Tony had left were color-coded with orange labels, which indicated White House staff. I do not recall seeing a Secret Service list in or around those files. However, in the course of assuming the update project, I learned that files for several, several other categories of holdover employees had already been requested, I presume by either Nancy or Tony. These files had already been incorporated into our working files of active pass holders, and therefore were not grouped together in separate bins. Over the next several months, I culled through the files Tony had left. By September 1995, when I left the Office of Personnel Security, I believed the update project was complete. My technique for sorting through Tony's files and for determining what additional previous reports I should order from the FBI was to start with a Secret Service list. The list I used was provided to us by the Secret Service on a monthly basis, but we could ask for updated copies more frequently. I understood that this was the Secret Service's list of active, active pass holders. It was well known around our office that the Secret Service list included names of people who no longer had active passes. I would check out each name on the list before ordering a previous report from the FBI by calling the office in the White House where that person supposedly worked. I also asked the supervisors of various offices to write me a list of the holdover employees who worked in those offices. In this fashion, I was able to develop my own list of those who were truly holdover employees. On many occasions, I would inform the women who worked in the Secret Service office who had provided us with the list that their list contained names that would, should no longer be there or that persons were listed as working in the wrong office. As time passed, these lists became more up to date. After determining which of Tony's files that I did not need, I put them in boxes to send to the Office of Records Management. Consistent with standard pra practice, I typed an inventory sheet containing the names on the labels of these files. I sent this inventory sheet with the boxes to Records Management. In the course of finishing the update project, I occasionally discovered that I had sent to records management a file for someone who was, in fact, an active employee, detailee, etc. I requested and received these files back from records management. I put these files with all of the other files 
of Office of Personnel Security on active White House employees in the vault. During the time I worked on the update project, I reviewed the contents only of files of employees whose active status I had confirmed. I was not reviewing the files for content, but to determine the date of their last background investigation. At no time did anyone ask me to provide them with a file of any past administration official, and I have no knowledge of anyone in the Clinton administration using these files for any improper purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wetzel. <clears throat> uh, we have now uh, heard the statements of all of our participants this morning discussing uh, their involvement, their personal lives. Mr. Livingston has announced his resignation. Uh, I think uh, it was the half thing for him to do, uh, perhaps overdue. This hearing is being conducted to get out the facts uh, surrounding the possession of more than 700, 700 now files. Yeah, the, we're under the five-minute rule. Uh, files of Reagan and Bush administration employees, and let's not forget that this began as an investigation of the White House travel office employees. Uh, I recognize Mr. Nussbaum as a lawyer myself, the uh, uh, litigator's uh, technique of turning the accused into the, the accuser into the accused, and I can understand that. Let me just say that documents which I have just this morning uh, entered into the record show numerous instances, I must tell you, uh, of troubling activity that occurred under your tenure, and we're going to want to discuss those during the course of this hearing. So I'm not going to respond to you personally, Mr. Nussbaum. I will let those documents speak for themselves. I do want to open the questioning for this hearing by going through... Uh, Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Are these documents that have been shared with the other members of the committee and the minority? They have been entered into the record. Will your staff make them available to us? Staff will certainly. If they've not already been made available, they are in the, the part of the record now. Attack, Mr. This Mr. is not on my time. Um, I do want to open the questioning this morning by going through uh, the political history of Mr. Marcisa and Mr. Livingston leading up to their joining back together in the White House Office of Personnel Security. I think by now we have all had uh, a lot of press accounts of the depth of uh, their political campaign work, but I. I think we need to have a clear public record of their previous experience in the political arena. I think it will provide a foundation and appropriate perspective on which we can view these individuals that President Clinton entrusted with the most sensitive information on all people who enter into government service. And so, Mr. Livingston, I would start with you and just ask you if you would to very simply answer yes or no to uh, some questions I want to propound to you. Uh, we understand, Mr. Livingston, that you worked on Gary Hart's campaign in 1984, is that correct? Just yes or no? Y yes, sir. Uh, and you, did you work on the Mondale Ferraro campaign in 1984? Yes, sir. Yes no? uh, I believe you worked for Senator Shinworth on his campaign transition and then in his Senate office. Yes, sir. And did you work for the Hollywood Women's Political Committee at some point? Yes, sir. And were you employed working on the Democratic Convention in 1988? Yes, sir. Uh, worked for Paul Kirk at the Democratic National Committee? Yes, sir. And I believe you also worked for Charlene Drew Jarvis, uh, the District of Columbia? Yes, sir. And uh, also on the Clinton-Gore campaign in 1992? Yes, sir. And I believe you also worked for Harry Thomason on security for the Presidential Inaugural Committee, is that correct? Mr. Thomason was one of the directors. Right. Mr. Marcisa. Yes, sir. Did you work as a field organizer on Senator Muskie's presidential campaign? Yes, sir, I did. Did you work on Senator McGovern's presidential campaign doing advance work? No, sir, I worked as a field organizer with uh, Senator McGovern. But you and did work on Senator McGovern's campaign? Yes, sir. Did you work on Senator John Glenn's campaign in any capacity? Yes, sir, I did. Did you work on Senator Hart's first campaign in 1984, then doing advance work? Yes, sir, I did. And did you work on the Mondale Ferraro presidential campaign doing advance work? I did. Uh, did you work on the Gore for President campaign in 1987 uh, doing advance work? I did two trips, sir. Did you, did you work on Senator Paul Simon's presidential campaign in 1987? Yes, sir. I, did. I think I did two trips for him also. Did you do any opposition research on any of on opponents at that time? Absolutely never. Okay. Uh, did you work with Mr. Livingstone on the presidential inaugural committee? I did. And, uh, could I add, sir, I worked for Ronald Reagan in 80. All right, thank uh, you. When I was registered as a Republican. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, let the, we'll let the averages uh, figure out I'm here. I'm sorry, it's About 98 percent uh, one side of here. How did, how, how did you come to work? Well, how did you come to work on the Clinton Inaugural Committee? Uh, how did you come to work on the Clinton Inaugural Committee? Um, after the President won the election, I uh, contacted Mr. Livingstone 
and told them that I had some use or lose leave to take, and I uh, checked with our legal staff. They said it was legal right. to engage in presidential inaugural committee okay. activities, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Livingstone, did you ask Anthony Marcis to work in the president's inaugural with you? I don't have a recollection. Okay. Mr. Nussbaum, uh, could you tell us who hired Craig Livingstone? <clears throat> My recollection, Mr. Chairman, is that at the time I arrived in the White House, on, a, on January 20th, 1993, or shortly thereafter, uh, Craig Livingston was acting already in the Office of Personnel Security. Well, that's, that's when Mr. Forster and I arrived. You're saying that he was he, there when you got there? He was in the White House, I believe, when I got there. That's my best memory. And so you don't recall? He you was, don't... Let me, can I finish my answer, yeah. Mr. Chairman, please? My recollection is that he was to report his job was to report, because we we're going to follow the procedures from the prior administration, he was going to report to Mr. Foster uh, in that role. Mr. Foster then urged me to bring... All right, let me, let me interrupt bring, you, because I, bring, only have, I have one more question to ask. To and what, you're, what you're basically telling me, Mr. Nussbaum, is that you do not know who hired Ray Livingston. That's I, my question. And I, I now want to ask no, Mr. I, Kennedy you, you, no, if he can tell us who Mr. hired Craig. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, the gentleman well, should be allowed to answer let me, the question. What I'm, what I'm saying the is... The answer to the question would be yes or no, is, Mr. Nussbaum. Did you know who hired Craig Livingston? I think I'm going to answer your question when I say that... It could be yes or no. Do you know who hired Craig Livingston? I don't know who brought Craig Livingston into That's the White House. That's the answer to my question. Mr. Foster, I, I want to ask Mr. Kennedy if he knows uh, who hired Craig Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. So rude, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. I just it, it just is a, requires a simple yes or no answer. Does the witness know who hired Craig Livingston? Point of Mr. order. Mr. Chairman, let me tell you, I asked Mr. F Mr. Foster how to make a determination, how to make a determination since this person was reporting to him whether this person, you know, was obviously competent to do that position. Mr. Foster obviously you know, obviously made such a determination because if he would have made another determination, he would have come to me and we would, and we would have gotten rid of him. So All right, thank you. But the answer to your question is, Mr. You, precisely who brought him into the White House, I, I do not know. Thank you. But, but nonetheless, thank we have you. responsibility for him, for him holding that position in the Mr. White House. Mr. Kennedy, would you respond to whether you know who hired Craig Livingston? Are you going to let me answer, Mr. Chairman? Yeah. It seems to me it requires a simple answer, yes or no. Do you know who hired Craig Livingston? Mr. Chairman, I've got to give a long answer just like Mr. Nussbaum tried to do. I'm not quite sure why that's necessary, but you may proceed. Mr. Chairman, when I arrived, I arrived sub subsequently later than Mr. Nussbaum. I arrived uh, the first week in February and went on the payroll on February the 10th, I believe. When I arrived, um, Craig was acting as uh, acting uh, director of the Office of White House Personnel Security. Um, I was informed by Mr. Foster that that was the position he was under consideration for. Um, I don't know who told Mr. Foster that or on what basis. I understand. So uh, neither of you gentlemen hired him, and uh, neither of you know basically who did hire he him. He could not have continued in that position unless Mr. Foster or Mr. Kennedy uh, made a determination that he could continue in that position. That's correct. Because he was reporting to us. That is correct. So ultimately, Mr. Chairman, I take responsibility for Mr. Oh, good. Livingston being the head of the, of the, head of the Office of Personnel Security. Good. That's right, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. My time has expired, and I would now uh, yield five minutes to the gentlelady from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I want to say right off the bat that I have, um, as a former precinct captain, et cetera, I have worked in every election, every Democratic election since President Johnson, and I'm proud of that fact. And, uh, and never at any time did I ever try to find any dirt on anybody. Um, Ms. Lisa Wetzel, when you determined that Mr. Marcisa had ordered too many files, did you bring that to Mr. Livingstone's attention? And what was his reaction? To the best of my recollection, I mentioned it to Craig, and his reaction was not memorable. I, I don't recall that there really was one besides him saying, oh, Tony, or, or something like that. Now, in your, in your uh, opening statement, you said that you discovered that Mr. Mercesa had gathered hundreds of FBI files and individuals who no longer worked in the White House, and you didn't believe this to be uh, a particularly uh, memorable. Uh, what did you do with those files, and why didn't you send them immediately back to the FBI? Well, it was my understanding that any uh, 
paperwork that was in our office that was to be moved out of our office had to go to records management. <clears throat> in fact, that had been told to me before by Nancy Gemmell before she left, that any paperwork that our office disposed of went through records management. And um, what I did with Tony, those files that Tony had left was I kept them for a while as I went through them to try to figure out who, who of those files I did need, who was a holdover employee in those files. And that took quite a bit of time. And then once I had, to my satisfaction, uh, figured that out, then I boxed them up and sent them to records management. Well, how do you think it happened that Mr. Marseille requested so many files of individuals from the previous administration? Well, I, I can only assume, and what I assumed at the time was that he had gone, his Secret Service list that he had gone through, he had ordered every file rather than looking at the list qualitatively. Mr. Marseille, so why did you, why did you look, why did you request so many files from the FBI? Um, Ma'am, I was going down the list that I had of people that I understood were on the access list and that they were supposed to uh, be allowed access to the White House. And I uh, understood that I was to uh, create files, recreate files on everybody on that list. I had no knowledge that there was no one. When I started that list, I had no knowledge that there was anybody on that list that was not supposed to have access to the White House. Now, Ms. Uh, Wetzel said that uh, there's a review of, of employees who were remaining at the White House every five years. Was there no breakout as to which employees had been there for five years and which had not been there for five years or anything like that? Uh, at, uh, at this moment, that's news to me. I don't know anything about that. You don't know anything about the five-year update? Uh, well, I do know about... I'm sorry, ma'am. I know about uh, that we do reinvestigations every five years. But are you referring to that or are you referring to no, some... No, I'm, I'm just saying that you knew there were some, that there were some employees who were holdover employees who had been there for a long period of time. You would think that since they had been there, say, in the previous administration, which was only for four years, that their credentials would have been uh, okay and didn't need to be followed up because they were holdover employees and the five-year period had not expired. Is that not the way it was done or am I looking at it in the wrong way? Well, ma'am, when I was doing my update... If they did not need a new reinvestigation, they were on the access li list. I presume that they were that they were qualified, bona fide people that should enter the White House, and therefore, I, if they had if they didn't need a reinvestigation, I put the file right into the file folder or into the files, and uh, things went along fine. It was it was only if I could not find them that I did something different. Okay, Miss Wetzel. Uh, would you say that Ms. Gimmel, the list that you and Ms. Gimmel, or the list that she had left for you was an outdated list? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, and that's why you think that you saw these uh, different names on there of people that you knew were in other administrations? Such on as her list? Fitzwater. You said that you knew that... Uh, well, the that was two separate. I saw Marlon Fitzwater's name on the, on the files that had been created by Tony. I... Uh, I don't recall specifically his name on Nancy's list, but it was pages and pages of names that I did not recognize and included previous administration employees. When you took over the update project, did you request a list from the Secret Service of those individuals that needed access? Uh, to the best of my recollection, we used, they gave us a monthly list, and I used that and went, combed through it, and any names that I didn't recognize um, was a red flag to me. After working in the office for a couple of years, I recognized most of the names. And uh, so any name I didn't recognize was a red flag to me to look into it. Well, by and large, was a list that they sent you, was that accurate or did it continue to uh, contain names of people who no longer worked in the administration? It continued to contain names that were no longer active pass holders, yes. Why do you think that was? A human error. A recurring human error by the uh, Secret Service? There were, the list itself was there were misspellings, there were names listed under wrong agencies. I would call that office to find out if that person still worked there. They tell me we'd never hear, heard so, of them. Let me interrupt you and say, well, can you describe what you did after you received the Secret Service list to determine its accuracy and what you found? What did you do? What, 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 what process did, I, did you do then? I would go through the list, and any name I didn't recognize, I would, I would look into it. I would see if we had a file on them. I would see um, if we didn't have a file on them, I'd call their office to find out if they were still there. Uh, 
finally what I did was called the supervisors of each of the various offices and asked them to send me a list of holdover employees and that coupled with the Secret Service list seemed to be pretty effective. So it seems like in the end you ended up assisting the Secret Service in updating their and correcting their list. Is that, would that be an accurate statement? Yes. Thank you. Gentlelady's time has expired. Um, now pleased to recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Burton, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I have before me, uh, can I have the attention of the committee? Uh, I have before me a letter from the Secret Service, and they say in this letter that the Secret Service databases do not produce documents in the format such as the one described above, and the one described above they're talking about is the personnel securities file uh, uh, list that you're talking about. The Secret Service said they did not produce that list. So the list had to come from somewhere else. We don't know where it came from. We're going to get to the bottom and find out. But the Secret I, Service says they I did not sir, produce this list. Now, I'm, not asking, I'm not asking any questions. Now I'm making some statements. Okay. Because I could answer you. Point of order. Are we making uncontested? Let the witness see the letter. Yeah, let the let witness see the letter and respond to it. I'll be happy to let them see let it. Let us see the entire time. letter. I'll be happy to let them see it on your time. Is this a star chamber, Mr. Chairman? Don't then, we, are we trying to get at the truth? The gentleman from Indiana has the time. He has indicated that he will make the letter available. It will become a part of the record. The witnesses will be have an opportunity to see the letter. The gentleman's time is on Indiana and is in, from Indiana has the time. I hope the interruption uh, did Mr. not... Mr. Chairman, the parliamentary point of procedure, Mr. Right. Chairman, if a witness is to be examined about a document, the witness and her counsel should have access to it and should be before her and no reference should gentlemen, otherwise be made this to point it. of order is not, is not in order because the gentleman was not asking the witness a question about the document. He was indicating that this was a letter that we had received, we which you will now have an uh, uh, opportunity to see. May we have a copy of that letter now, Mr. Chairman? Of course. Thank of you. Of course. Uh, the gentleman from Indiana is recognized. Yeah, don't take away from my time for that, well, you that have, interruption, uh, Mr. Chairman. give you another minute. In addition, uh, I'm happy that uh, Mr. Nussbaum uh, has accepted uh, the authority for uh, hiring uh, uh, the gentleman. Mr. Burton, he couldn't stay uh, in the job unless, you know, but, Mr. But, Foster. But, order. but I would just like to say that you can delegate authority, but you cannot delegate responsibility. You were the counsel to the president. That's you good. were the president's spokesman. And there were between, by my count, 14 and 23 separate requests made of the FBI for these files and although your name wasn't signed on them your name was on them and for there to be 14 to 23 requests and you to be the counsel for the president and the supervisor supervisory uh, agency over this gentleman and to not know about it you know that 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 uh, is something that should be questioned you heard now Gordon Gray let, testify. Let me, could I, can I no, answer you I, I'm not asking any questions I'm making not some comments in answer, now right? I'm making some comments now I see now I, I want to know and I hope to find out where this list came from because as I said before and we're making this available the list did not come from the Secret Service according to them now we're up to 700 people who've had their files brought from the FBI to the White House it's been stated that uh, this has not happened before it was a stupid mistake that stretches credulity uh, similar action was taken by the State Department in September of 1993 when there was 165 personnel files rummaged through, and Mr. Joseph uh, Tarver called the Washington Post not once, but 45 times, spring and summer of 1993, uh, to get, try to get into the paper some dirt on those people. And two were reported, Jennifer Fitz Fitzgerald and Elizabeth uh, Tamposi. Now, the two gentlemen in question here, let's talk a little bit about their background. Dennis Casey, in a sworn deposition, said, and I quote, Mr. Livingstone had a legal pad with him, this is during the Hart campaign, and he began to report on some peccadillos and vulnerabilities of those persons in hopes of either neutralizing them or getting their support switched from Mondale to Hart. I do not recall the names of the leaders at this, uh, at this time, but I do recall a number of them were from the Beaver County area, of which Mr. Livingston was a uh, member, native. I should note, too, that that's a strong labor section and a heavy Democratic voter registration area. I was greatly upset with Mr. Livingstone as I viewed the matters he was reporting as personnel matter, personal matters that would adversely affect the lives and families of those people. Mr. Livingstone disagreed and I reinforced my direction to him to stop that type of work. He, as I recall, left the room angrily. Later that evening I met Mr. Marcica, Marcisa, who I understand was a member of the Hart National Campaign staff assigned to Pittsburgh. He talked to me about the worth of Mr. Livingstone's information, and I recall he stated that it was time for the Hart campaign to play hardball with the dirt Mr. Livingstone had gathered. 
Uh, and later, Mr. Marsik, I understand, was accused of taking money from the petty cash box, and, and, and the two were removed from that, that pitch, the Pennsylvania campaign. The point I'm trying to make is there was a history of this type of activity, and, and also uh, uh, Mr. Livingstone has admitted to using various kinds of drugs. Now, to put people who have this kind of a problem... Mr. Chairman, point of order. Mr. Chairman, Gentlemen, if state. we're having a hearing and witnesses here, Maybe we can allow them to go home so that the members on that side can just testify. And as I, as I chairman. indicated at the outset of the hearing, I indicated that we would not accept opening statements from members of the committee, but that they could use the uh, five minutes uh, for the purpose of making an opening yeah. statement. Are you going to allow the witnesses five minutes to respond to some of the incorrect factual information being put in the record by the members of the committee? The gentleman from Indiana is recognized for an additional minute given the fact there have been some interruption. Everything that I have said is documented either with a sworn document or by a letter from the Secret Service. Now, what I'm saying is, and, and, and I will pose this as a question to Mr. Kennedy, the, when you hire somebody to put them in a position of the importance of Mr. Livingstone, I assume you get a, an FBI background check. And I assume that in that background check you would have found out some of this information that I've raised right now that would have been questioned by you and also his use of, uh, of drugs in the past. And, and it seems to me that those would have been questions that would have been put to him before he was hired and put in that sensitive position. If he was a political operative with this kind of a background, why would you give him access to FBI files on Republicans to the tune of 700? What's your question, Mr. Burton? You didn't understand that? I, I, if you'd restate your question, I'll answer it. I will it. state it one more time. <laughs> and that is, you get FBI background checks when you hire somebody for sensitive positions at the White House. That's, I'm sure you, you would agree with that. Now, in that background check from the FBI, you found out or you already knew that he used a numerous kinds of drugs in the past, number one. And number two, you would have found out that he was a political operative, and you would have found out about this, uh, uh, this foray into nefarious activities of other people in, during the Hart campaign. And if you found that out from those FBI reports, reports, why would you put somebody like that in a position of sensitivity like he was in, who had access to getting as many as 700 files from the FBI? Congressman Burton, um, I am prohibited by the Privacy Act from commenting about anything in anybody's background. And thus, I don't know the source of your allegations, but I cannot talk about the information that I know from reviewing anyone's background. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, first of all, I want to ask all of our witnesses, do you understand the seriousness of testifying before a committee of the Congress under oath and that if you lie to us, you could be prosecuted for the crime of perjury? Do you all understand that? Yes, I do, sir. Now, understanding that fact, you've all admitted there was a terrible mistake, a huge bureaucratic, bureaucratic blunder. Do any of you at this witness table know whether any political use was made of the lists that were obtained from the FBI, whether there were any enemies lists compiled for political purposes, or whether any of this information was disseminated to anybody outside of the White House? Absolutely not, sir. No. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. <clears throat> we have had testimony here that what we have had is a serious bureaucratic blunder. I wouldn't want to minimize it in any way. But, Mr. Chairman, I don't think it ought to be blown out of all proportion. I'm appalled that a member of Congress who's protected by the Constitution from any liability for anything any of us say would start to go on uh, attack about somebody's prior presumed maybe drug use or what somebody else said somewhere else about him. I just think that that is sheer McCarthyism. Would the gentleman yield? No, I won't. It's in the Let report. me further go on to say that this isn't a hearing to get to the bottom of this issue. This is a hearing to smear President Clinton and his administration to be reckless with the truth for partisan purposes. And it's not worthy of this committee, Mr. Chairman. It's not worthy of this committee. 
Before we had any evidence, the chairman held a press conference, and he accused Mr. Nussbaum of, at best, being unethical and, at worst, committing a felony. Mr. Chairman, that was a reckless statement. I think we ought to have any evidence that you or any of your colleagues have that any improper use was made of these files, that, in fact, Mr. Nussbaum, who acted the same as every other counsel to the president, as we heard last week when we heard from the counsels to the president, uh, Reagan and uh, Bush, I think he's due an apology, and I'll yield to you to try to justify the kind of statement that you made attacking Mr. Nussbaum's credibility and forthrightness and, and integrity. I've already stated that uh, I can understand the attempt to demonize the accuser, but this is not uh, a question of whether or not he was accused of anything. I said that there was a, a, a memo under his name that uh, requested these documents, and it, clearly that was a reason enough to begin to ask the questions that we've been asking ever since. The, the memo was to get Billy, Day, Billy Ray Dale's file. There Mr. was no Chairman. possible justification for receiving that file, Mr. Chairman. given the fact that Mr. Dale had been out of the White House for seven months. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I Chairman could I say something, Mr. Chairman? Uh, it's my time, Mr. Nussbaum, yeah. if you want to respond Mr. Chairman, briefly. as you now know, I never saw that memo, that typewritten form. That was a form in use for 30 years. Other counsel never saw those forms also, as you heard last week. Why didn't you just pick up the phone, Mr. Chairman, and call me before you went on national television to say, at best, I'm unethical, and worst, I'm a felon? You called Billy Dale, Mr. Chairman. You had him stand out at your press conference, but you didn't call me. And Mr. we know Nussbaum, each other, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Nussbaum, I'm surprised you could, didn't do that, Mr. Chairman. If I Chairman. could reclaim my time. At the time, Mr. Chairman, you made your press statement accusing Mr. Nussbaum. You thought perhaps he knew that uh, uh, the information was being required from the FBI. Now, you now know under his statement under oath that that's not accurate. Do you want to make any changes in your statement accusing him of being perhaps a felon? Or are we on the track of personal destruction for partisan purposes, a reckless use of a committee to try to smear people, so to hope that maybe the Republicans will gain? Is that what we've come to? This committee started this inve investigation because the chairman thought that Mr. Dale was being treated unjustly. That may well have been true, but are we going to substitute another injustice, accusing Mr. Nussbaum and others at this table? I want to yield to Mr. Chairman if you have anything further you want to say, because I think this gentleman is owed an apology. I, let me ask Mr. Nussbaum, were you aware that during the time of the White House Management Review, which was during your tenure, that your office obtained the personnel files of all seven travel office employees? Mr. Podesta, in connect, I gather, I learned today, Mr. Podesta, in connection with the Management Review, you did not know that those files... I did not know because, Mr. Chairman, the management review was done in a way to sort of, since it involved our office, we were sort of conflicted out of the management review. And that is why Mr. Podesta and Mr. Stern were delegated by Mr. Panetta and Mr. McClarty to conduct the management review. So the answer to your question is no. I did not know that Mr. Right. Podesta obtained Mr. Chairman, the personnel reclaiming, files. Mr. claiming a minute or so of my time. Less. <laughs> what is so amazing to me is why every administration took all these files with them and it all had to be recreated. I'd like Under to Under law, they are required Mr. to take Chairman, them with them. Mr. Chairman, it's my time. I just Mr. Correct. Chairman, it's my time. And I want to be given an additional time the way you did to Mr. Burton. Why did they take these files? And what security is there with all these files taken from the FBI in Mr. Bush's or Mr. Reagan's library? I, I think there are a lot of questions we ought to have answered because it seems to me that people have follow, followed procedures that didn't make any sense. And I'm, it's unfortunate we've come to this to correct the, the crazy procedures that were followed by this administration, but they're the same procedures that were followed by the Bush and the Reagan administration. The gentleman's well. time has expired, and I would now recognize the gentlelady from Maryland if she would yield to me just for one comment. Indeed, I, I will yield to you for Only to make comment, Mr. a Chairman. point to the gentleman from California that under the Presidential Records Act, all files must be removed from the White House when an administration leaves. They then become a part of the presidential uh, library for that president, 
We may want to change that, but under the present situation, that is the law. Where are the I safeguards for their privacy well, if they're given well, well, away to these presidential the libraries? Gentleman, the gentleman from, the gentlelady from Maryland. I, I, I yield five seconds to the gentleman from I just from want Indiana. to say that Mr. the statements that I, I made came out of records. Mr. Livingstone's sworn statement, none of this was hyperbole. It all came out of records that were sworn well, to. still wasn't a nice thing to do. Now I guess I can commence, because, Mr. Chairman, I think it's, it's absolutely lot. appropriate that this Committee on Reform and Oversight be uh, searching for the truth. The American people deserve it. And last week at the hearing, uh, we heard from witnesses who detailed how things were done in previous administrations, and we appear to see a, a contrast to today's uh, uh, testimony. Uh, I think there are some very critically important questions uh, that we are posing to the witnesses that need to be answered why these 707 FBI files were requested, what was done with these files, uh, why did we have longtime political operatives, uh, Craig Livingstone and Arthur Masika, in positions that allowed them to have access to and hold on to such sensitive information. We're trying to determine who hired them, why weren't these files sent back to the FBI once they were discovered. And I think at the heart of today's hearing is the question, who is responsible for these actions? I did have a chance to uh, review the depositions taken by this committee. It's clear that while there is a lot of finger pointing and confusion, there, there are still many questions that are unanswered. And ultimately, we must answer this question. Was this the result of gross and inept mismanagement, or was it uh, kind of digging for dirt with another motive? At a minimum, a terrible breach of privacy has occurred where more than 700 citizens, many of whom are my constituents, have been victimized by the uh, White House. If I wanted my own FBI file, I would need to file a Freedom of Information Act request. And today there is a backlog of about several years in order to get that information. They're still processing 1992 requests. And yet, over 700 people, people who couldn't even get their own files if they requested them, are uneasy because they know that in their files they are in an unlocked vault in the White House. They were requested by interns from what we heard at the last uh, uh, hearing uh, and uh, without any kind of certain security clearance. They were stored in a vault with a photocopy machine nearby. There's no way to respect our citizens' most uh, private information. I wanted to just um, ask a few questions in my time that I have. And Mr. Livingstone, I'm going to direct many of them to you, sir. Um, what I wanted to ask you is, can you describe the type of activities that you had interns and volunteers performing in the White House Office of Personnel Security during 1993? Um. I believe it was our practice uh, specifically uh, when we had an intern or a volunteer for myself and others on our staff to first brief them about the, uh, the nature of some of the documents that we did have in our office uh, as to the sensitivity. Um, as in other areas of the White House, we briefed them on what uh, uh, top secret and secret documents looked like, to, uh, blue and orange covers and that if they ever saw documents like that, they were not to peruse did, them. Did, they, did interns ever participate in the requisitioning of FBI background files? Um, I don't know the specific answer to that question. I think it's yes. Well, did if, interns if, ever assist? If I could expand on it, ma'am, I believe the general practice in our office was at the direction of a staff member that the, uh, an intern may have well word processed a document for the request, but a staff member always initiated that work and asked for that work to be submitted to the FBI. Uh, did the interns have security clearance? No, ma'am. They did not, right. And then, and then to Mr. Nussbaum, um, with regard to your statement about you didn't know what was happening, wasn't your, didn't your name have to be on uh, the FBI file request forms that were being filled out by the interns? I mean, whether it was a stamp name of yours or not, did it have to be on that? As I understand it, for 30 years, that basically same form was used with the White House counsel's name, whether it was me or Boyden Gray or people prior to Boyden Gray, stamped on that form. That's right. what I understand right now. Okay, yes. so, I mean, what, 
what that means then is that because your name is on that form, even though it had been customary, that you do assume responsibility. Of course, yes. I do assume responsibility. Mm -hmm. I was the senior person in the White House Counsel's Office. The o Office of Personnel Security reported to the White House Counsel's Office. It was not part of the White House Counsel's Office, but a report to it. This happened, as I said in my statement, Congresswoman, sure. on my watch, and I do assume responsibility. Did you, did you know, uh, sir, that the interns did not have security clearance? No, I, I was not familiar with whether the interns had security clearance or not. I left that to other people on my staff. But I do understand, Congresswoman, that the interns never, the, infer, the interns were never given access to any, or never viewed, to the best of my knowledge, any information that they shouldn't view. But they were relegated to doing it, is my understanding, were file functions, mechanical functions, typing up labels and things like that. So I have no knowledge that any intern ever violated those kind of restrictions. Right, right. You may not know that, sir, but they mean they may have. They may have. And, and I Anything have, is possible. That's I have correct. great qualms about that, the kind of sensitive information that is on those forms. I've seen that standard form um, 86 and, and the fact that you could listen to what some neighbor says about you and that could end up being on there. And I have a question about the, whether there's any IRS uh, income tax information. The gentlelady's time has expired. Right. I think Maybe they would answer that uh, anyway. Anybody can answer with the I, whether there's any IRS information, tax information yes, on any of those forms. Anyone who would volunteer to try to answer it? Maybe who, are, who are you asking? If you're asking me, I can answer it. Oh, I'd like to ask you then. Okay. Uh, for previous administration employees whose previous reports we were asking for, we would not receive any tax information. Um, it is part of um, the permanent pass process, part for a new employee that they fill out a waiver saying that, yes, we can ask the IRS for a review of their tax records. So, yes, the IRS does send, send back a summary report to us for new employees or for people undergoing a reinvestigation. Gentlelady's time has expired. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Lantos, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Last week I suggested that this is a political witch hunt and uh, this hearing fully confirms uh, that earlier judgment. While I have no way, Mr. Chairman, to compel you to do that, as an old friend, I respectfully request that you submit to all members of this committee the political activities of all members of the majority staff during their entire career. I want to know on what campaigns the majority staff members worked during their entire career, because this is what we are asking these people. Most of the staff here are not civil servants. They are obviously working occasionally on political campaigns. This is in the American democratic tradition. I will ask my good friend, Congresswoman Collins, to do the same. I want to know, since it has been portrayed as a crime to work on the Muskie campaign or the Hart campaign or the Mundale campaign, we would like to know your staff. Will the gentleman yield? No, I not, will not yield unless you give me extra time. I will then yield. Uh, what I am suggesting is... Well, I'll give is, you 30 seconds if I may uh, respond to that. Please, Mr. Chairman. I would just point out that the difference here is that in previous administrations, apolitical people were put in these very sensitive jobs. The only thing that we were suggesting was it was inappropriate to put people who had very, very long political resumes to put them in a position to be looking at very sensitive files. And I would yield back. Uh, will you also provide that list for the use of the committee, Mr. Chairman, I requested? Uh, we will discuss that after this hearing, but I'm not sure that I'm, I'm understanding exactly what you're asking for. Well, uh, we'll see. Let me, let me also say that uh, since all of you are on, uh, uh, under oath, I, want, I will want at the conclusion of my comments go around and get an answer to a very simple question. Did anybody above you in rank direct you to undertake the collection of FBI files for political purposes? I will ask that when I'm finished. I must say, uh, Ms. Livingstone, that I am pleased you submitted your resignation. You should have done that earlier. As you know, I was the first member of Congress calling for the White House, calling on the White House to fire you because you did not resign, and I am pleased that you finally saw that this was the minimum, the minimum you should do 
in accepting a modicum of responsibility. With an infinitely more distinguished public record than yours, Admiral Burda committed suicide when he may have committed a minor mistake. So, so the fact is, it's a good thing you did it. You should have done this a, a long time ago. Uh, I want to, I want to, I want to ask Mr. Marsika um, a very simple question also. In reading your statement, there isn't a scintilla of acceptance of responsibility, there isn't a scintilla of, ex of expressing an apology to individuals whose privacy rights were violated. You, sh you should thank Ms. Wetzel for cleaning up your mess. You have indicated in your written statement not one iota of recognition of the problem you created with your stupid actions, which has created all this attention, all this devotion of energy to this, to this effort. You really owe everybody, including this committee and the American people, an apology. And there has been not the slightest indication on your part that you are aware of what you did. Now, uh, since enemies list has been mentioned many times in these hearings, for the record, I would like to state that Mr. Nixon had an enemies list carefully constructed and very logical from his point of view. What we are dealing with here clearly are lists, whether it's 300, 500, or 700 people, most of whom have no high-profile political position. So whether it's an innocent mistake, as you call it, Mr. Livingstone, or an idiotic mistake, as I call it, it's, it clearly seems to be at that level. Now I would like to, um, I would like to ask each of you to comment on the basic question I have raised. Has anybody above your grade, which in your case, uh, Ms. Nussbaum would be the president, ever instructed you to obtain confidential FBI files for political purposes. It is even absurd, Congressman Lantos, to even contemplate such a notion. This I agree with you. Would do so. The answer to your question is no. Ms. Wetzel. No. Mr. Livingstone. Absolutely not. Mr. Marseka. No. Mr. Kennedy. No, sir. Has anybody, to the best of your knowledge, and I want to go around again, having obtained these files for the White House, has anybody, to the best of your knowledge, used these for political purposes? Mr. Nussbaum. No. Ms. Wetzel. No, sir. Mr. Livingstone. No. Mr. Marsika. No. Mr. Kennedy. Absolutely not. Let me then uh, go back to Mr. Nussbaum, because I was extremely impressed by your statement. Uh, which is uh, reflective of a very distinguished uh, uh, history as an outstanding attorney in this country. Could you explain in your own words how you think this whole event mushroomed to the present status? <laughs> you know, that's a very good question, Congressman. Unfortunately, when we came into the White House, there were tremendous pressures to cut staff, to cut budget, pressures coming from Congress and from within the White House itself. So in a sincere effort, well, at the same time, let me say, the same time when a new administration comes in, and especially an administration, a Democratic administration replacing a public, public Republican administration, there's an enormous workload. I think even Mr. Gray, Boyden Gray, recognized this in his testimony the other day. So here we were faced with a combination of an enormous workload, new people coming in, new people coming in, some for the first time to the White House in their lives, as well as at the same time a pressure to cut the staff. The president wanted to cut the staff. He promised that during the campaign, and the staff was cut, and Congress wanted to limit the White House budgets. So when you have those two dynamics working together, you're forced to, in order to try to do the job, and Mr. Kennedy and I were forced to, to force to use detailees and even use interns. Now, we try to get the best people we could, and to, we try to make sure they did the right job. 
but it's not a desirable way of functioning. I remember, Congressman Lantos, conversation after conversation that Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Forster, and I had with the Chief of Staff, Mac McClarty at the time, and other people in the White House, that we desperately needed more help to perform these functions. In fact, when I used to get involved in these functions, that's the only time I did get involved, to plead with them for more help. They tried to do the best they could. Mr. McClarty was under pressure, other people were under pressure. They tried to do the best they could. The fact is, we really didn't have enough people at that time to do it. We did the best we could. We tried to get the best people. And this is why I think, you know, an error like this might have occurred. The gentleman's time has expired, and I'm now pleased to recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Gilman, for five minutes. Before I do that, I want to ask unanimous consent that certain documents that have been referred to this morning be entered as part of the record, specifically a request for White House Travel Office personnel files, second email from the FBI discussing the indictment of Billy Dale, and third memos from uh, Mr. Harry Thomason to Darnell Martins regarding the White House uh, press story. Mr. Chairman, our point of inquiry is one of, as part of unanimous consent request, are you including the letter Mr. Burton displayed? Secret Service letter? I would include that as, as part of the unanimous And then my second question is, it, it, since it's already been brought out, uh, that letter, had the witnesses had a chance to get a copy of it? Yes. Okay. They have. Mr. Chairman, uh, parliamentary uh, inquiry, right Mr. Check. Chairman. Uh, the gentleman will state his parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Chairman, since you outlined uh, the witnesses' Democratic Party activities, we now learn that Mr. Marsika worked for Ronald Reagan. Could we also obtain their Republican Party activities? Well, the, their political activity was in their deposition, which is now made a part of the record. The Please chair now recognizes. Right check, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, I'm not, uh, well, well I, we haven't had a chance to review the documents first that you're talking about putting into the record. If we could just uh, see what they are. Well, uh, we'll I'll res I'll. Withdraw the AMS consent request to uh, have the documents to distributed to, to the you, Mr. Uh, to Mrs. Collins, and we'll uh, reactivate that request as soon as you've had a chance to review them. Thank you. And now, please to recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Gilman. For five Thank minutes. you, Mr. Chairman. I want to commend you uh, for conducting this hearing, for all the work in, you and your staff have done in trying to get to the bottom of the White House Travel Office investigation and subsequent discovery that the staff of the White House Personnel Security Office requested and obtained a confidential FBI background files of several White House Travel Office employees, in addition to the files 340 former Reagan and Bush administration employees. As I've noted previously, due to the seriousness of this violation of the Privacy Acts uh, and privacy rights of the private citizens and a possible misuse of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, I don't look upon this inquiry as any exercise in partisanship. Many have decried that it becomes more difficult with each passing year to attract the most qualified and accomplished in our society to serve the American people. And those who want to serve the government have often sacrificed greater financial gain and have cons consented to some loss of their privacy to serve. However, when I see the manner in which personal files were haphazardly handled in the White House, and when we see the lack of supervision on employees who seem to have little background in the area of sensitive security matters, and when we hear a statement from the director of the FBI, a gentleman who we have immense respect for, that states, and I quote, the prior system of providing files to the White House relied on good faith and honor Unfortunately, the FBI and I were victimized, close quote. It's no wonder why the best and brightest are often reluctant to serve. There's no doubt that we must investigate and repair a system that's obviously broken. Let's hope that these hearings will enable us to accomplish that. One question, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be pleased to yield to you. Mr. Kennedy, you stated in your sworn testimony that this, uh, before this committee that the initial paperwork for presidential appointees went to Craig Livingston's office, and you said, as a matter of convenience, the IRS tax check forms came to Craig's office and came upstairs to us. Uh, did Mr. Livingston actually receive this IRS information on presidential appointees as well as other White House staff? Congressman, uh, we attempted to separate it out 
keep the two functions separate. Well, so if, if it did, it would did, be, it'd be a matter of inadvertence. I'm asking, did any of the IRS information uh, end up with Mr. Livingston? With regard to what, Congressman? With regard to these files that were you asked for. Well, Congressman, people who were being considered for White House access for permanent passes received IRS checks, and they became a part of the files in Mr. Livingstone's office, the Office of White House Personnel so Security. So what you're saying, Mr. Livingston did receive the IRS information, is that correct? His office did in the normal course of business, yes. All right, thank you. I'm pleased to yield to the chairman. I thank the uh, gentleman very much. Uh, Mr. Marcisa, late yesterday afternoon, we did receive about 200 pages of documents that your attorney reported were produced from two computer diskettes that you kept after you left the White House in February of 1994. The largest portion of the documents retrieved from your personal computer diskettes have a heading at the top of each page entitled Previous Reports Received, and then a few spaces over there is a date. One of the pages that I'm looking at and have seen is it's stamped with number 35 and is dated September 20th, 1993. Underneath this heading is an alphabetical list of names beginning with the letter A and going through the alphabet all the way to the letter Z through pages stamped 47. Next to each name is a date, and then a few spaces over on this series of lists is the letter N. Mr. Marcisa, will you please describe to this committee exactly what this group of documents are and when you created this list? What pages? 35. Sorry. Congressman, what pages, please? Uh, 35. Did you create the list? Oh, what's the question? That's a good question. Uh, your question again, Mr. Congressman, please. Mr. Chairman, your question, please. Uh, did you create this list? Uh, yes, I believe I did. When? Uh, I believe it was on the 20th of September. Well, I'm not sure about that. I have to check the uh, disk. But sometime in 1993, or the fall of 1993? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I believe it's 20th of September, 93, it was created. Are all of the, these names people who were on the National Security Council at the White House at some time? Uh, I got these names off the list, sir, that I... You didn't identify them as being on National Security Council. Weren't you looking for uh, reviewing files for National Security Council individuals? Uh, yes, sir. I was, this is part of the update project. Did you have any instructions specifically concerning ordering and receiving uh, the FBI previous reports on these individuals? Y yes, sir. Actually, the files were already prepared in the vault when I got there, and all I did was order the previous investigations. I, many of the people on the list uh, were only on the council during the Reagan or Bush administrations and were not in any way connected with the Clinton administration. So the question is, why would you have received previous reports on those individuals who clearly were no longer had need for uh, any kind of a background information? Sir, when I walked into the uh, first day in the, on the, in the White House, there were a number of file folders already prepared, and these NSC folders were prepared and in the vault, and I think we might be able to verify that here today with people at the table. And what I did was order the previous investigations as I understood I was supposed to do for all those folks that had files. I was recreating files, sir. Did you, did you Mr. Marcisa, take those files home with you at any time? Uh, yes, sir. I took my file. I, I had a CID computer. So I took them home every day. And you did take it. I so, took them home every day, yes, sir. So the early, it was early testament. None of these ever left the White House. In fact, uh, these files had left the White House. Correction, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, did not, I never took files home. I took the computer Excuse disk home. Okay. Excuse, thank you. You typed the name Brent Scowcroft and Robert Gates, uh, and you're suggesting uh, that you never knew who these individuals were or the inappropriateness of requesting background files on people who were clearly members of previous administrations? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Gates, according to this list, it says the last investigation would have been in 1991. I would have never looked at the second time at that. It, he didn't need an update. I would have never asked to find out if Mr. Gates were in the White House or not. My time has expired. Uh, I would now recognize the gentleman from West Virginia for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm concerned that much of this hearing is getting a field into more sensationalism. So let's get back to some facts. I'm going to ask you to answer very quickly. It seems to me there's a, in the search for truth, there's a certain hierarchy here. Right now, I think everyone concedes that this is at, at the best a case of gross incompetence and error. The question then is, is there anything past that? 
and that's what we ought to be concerned with. Uh, the hierarchy, I think, is what use, if any, were made of the files that were obtained, who ordered the files, where did the list come from, um, uh, and then after that, perhaps, relevance as to whether or not individuals should have been in the positions they were in. The, the question I have, and I'll go first to uh, Mr. Livingstone and Mr. Marcisa, uh, in reminding you, as others have, that, of course, you are under oath, uh, subject to criminal sanctions for perjury. Did any of the material that was obtained from these files in the update project go outside your office, outside the physical confines of the office that you worked in uh, into other parts of the White House? Mr. Livingstone? I don't believe so, sir. Can you state that cert with certainty? You're uh, the supervisor of that office, are you not? Yes, sir. I'm not trying to be, uh, I'm not trying to be uh, difficult. Uh, I don't maintain an vigilant view of that office 24 hours a day so I'm trying to say with some certainty while I was there. Did you carry any of it outside? Uh, only through a normal course of channels which would be to counsel's office. And let, uh, we'll come back to that. Mr. Marcisa, same question. Uh, Mr. Congressman, the documents that I handled, I considered that they were classified documents. I treated them as classified documents. Nobody touched the documents. They went from the file to my desk back in the locked vault. There was tight control in that White House. Ms. Wetzel? No. Okay. Uh, did anyone request you to obtain uh, files uh, that, did anyone outside your office request you to obtain files uh, in giving you specific names? Mr. Marcisa? No, no, sir. Mr. Livingstone? No, sir. Ms. Wetzel? No, sir. Uh, did you share the information from these files with anyone in the White House? Um, uh, particularly those that have been identified as politically sensitive, uh, obviously names of Republican office holders or people who had once been in the White House, James Baker, people like that. Did this was this information distributed to anyone else in the White House? Mr. Marcisa? Congressman, not, uh, not in my uh, realm. I had the update project. I worked on that. Mr. Livingstone? I don't believe that I was ever requested. I don't have any knowledge of anyone in my office. Uh, did you, that material. Did you share this information in any way? No, sir. Ms. Wetzel? I did not share this information in any uh, way, and I have no knowledge of anyone else sharing this information Mr. in any way. Mr. Marcisa, the list that you ordered from, did you create that list, or was that list one that was in a file? Did you find, was that list given to you uh, when you came on board? There were a number of lists, but the update project list itself was one series of, of uh, lists and then there, we would get list, other lists in from the Secret Service as, uh, for people that need reinvestigation, current employees that, and holdover employees. Other than the Secret Service, did you add any names at anyone's request, any other person's request, other than the Secret Service? No, sir. It either was on the it was Secret Service file. It was on, either on the Secret Service li list or I didn't do it. There were, the Secret Service list, Mr. Marcisa, is that the one that's that Ms. Gemmell left in the vault when she, or left in a safe when she left, or that she testified that she left? As I recall, there was a list in the safe, and I can't contribute that or attach that to the one that Ms. Gimmel was working on because she wasn't there, sir, when I yes. started. That, that brings up another question. Thank you for bringing that up. Did you meet at any time with Ms. Gemmel to discuss the project update? Yes, sir, I did. Was it before or after she left uh, the employee of the White House? I turned some notes over to the to chairman, and they, that was on August 9th, 93, I met with Ms. Gimmel and made some handwritten notes. Did you have any kind of telephone conversation with her subsequent to that, uh, seeking advice, uh, what do I do in this situation? No, sir. I, uh, the only conversation I had with her was around Christmas. I said, happy holidays, that's all, sir. How would you have had that conversation? I believe she, she either called or somebody called her and said around the holidays. Okay. Did, um, uh, did anyone, Mr. Livingstone, Mr. Marcisa, Ms. Wetzel, did anyone ever contact Ms. Gemmel following her leaving the White House uh, to ask suggestions, advice about the update project, uh, about the list that she left? Mr. Marcisa has indicated he did not. Mr. Livingstone? I don't have any uh, recollection of talking to Ms. Gemmel about the update list after her departure. Ms. Wetzel? No. Ms. Wetzel, uh, Mr. Burton, 
uh, waved a letter up here say, saying it was from the Secret Service. Let me read to you. Have you had a chance to examine this letter? Yeah, yes, I have. And you have a chance to examine sec or number seven, uh, note seven, in which, the, and I will quote partially, supervisors and technical experts associated with our access control branch during the past six years have opined, nice word, that the list shown to us by the committee was not produced by the Secret Service. Secret Service databases do not produce documents in the format such as the one described above. But yet I thought you testified earlier that you had destroyed the list so they could not have been looking at at least the original of what you had, could they? I believe the list that they are talking about in this paragraph is one that I myself typed up when I archived those files. This list, the Secret Service database did not produce lists that in this format. I produced that list. And so, but the list that was that I thought Mr. Burton was trying to make a point. Uh, he's that, speaking about the wrong list. He's speaking about the wrong list. And furthermore, did you not testify that you had thrown in the trash or destroyed that list that Ms. Gemmell had left, had left in the uh, safe? Yes, I did. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. I would now renew my unanimous consent request that the 11 pages of documents, which I believe the <coughs> already has not had a chance to review, be made a part of the record at this point. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. Uh, I'd like to uh, make a point that if they would go down to section 9 of that same letter, it explains that the database and the lists that were compiled from those databases do not change. A point of order, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my time was expired. Is it not the gentleman's, or can we get I know, engaged but I another to round? Clarify. I wanted to clarify, Mr. Chairman, that Section 9 explains what I was talking about. Okay. The chair now is pleased to recognize the gentleman from New Mexico, the vice chairman of the committee, Mr. Schiff, for five thank, minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, I want to say first that it was suggested that people were being criticized for working in political campaigns. Nothing could be farther from the truth. I welcome people working in Republican, Democratic, or other party campaigns. The issue is where people with a political motivation allowed access to sensitive law enforcement information, and if so, was that information abused? There's no criticism of people working in campaigns. Mr. Marcisa, I want to bring this directly to what I think is the point. I, I think it's established that several hundred files were requested from the FBI on personal backgrounds by you and these files were not appropriate to be requested at that time. They involve people who used to work at the White House under the previous administrations, but no further. I think that's the premise. The exact question for you is this. Where did the list come from by which you ordered these files? It came from the, the vault. And, it, and if, uh, I'm under the understanding that the Secret Service generated it. You say you're under understanding. Uh, what made you, did it say Secret Service, or what indicated it was a Secret Service list? Well, it was my general understanding um, from Mr. Livingstone and Gimmel and the other people in the office that that was the update list, and it was the... Who exactly told you that is the proper list to use? I, exactly, specifically, I can't recall that someone said, this is a Secret Service list, this is what you use. Did, but you, when, did you use more than one list? For the update project? Yes. To order uh, the files. To order the files. Did you use more than one list? I ordered, uh, we're talking about the universe of files now? The, the hundreds of Republican files that you should not have ordered. Did you use more than one list to order those files? Sir, there was a lot of Republicans that worked in the White House that I, I said, ordered their I files. I said the ones that were not appropriately ordered, the ones that did not seek access okay. to the White House. Did their names, were their names on one list or more than one list? The, the, uh, the names that I ordered on the update list were from the f vault, from the files in the vault. That's where I got those names. And once again, did anyone specifically tell you that was the right list to use? Uh, I believe I was, led, I was led to believe that that was the correct list to be using, yes. By whom? Uh, by Mr. Livingstone, by uh, uh, Nancy Gimmel, by people that worked in the office. No one called it to my attention. It was the wrong list. Did you ever take any of this information in any form home with you? Uh, I don't. Are you talking about documents, Congressman? Or summaries of documents or analyses of documents? I took my, my CID issued computer to my house with me and I did other investigations on that computer. Did that computer, which you took back with you, did that contain information from these uh, confidential law enforcement personnel files. The information it contained is what we provided to the, uh, to the committee. Well, I'd like you to look at a document. I wonder if someone from the staff can give a document marked 000134. 
That number was made by your attorney, I'm told. And it appears to be a copy of a memorandum to Craig Livingston from yourself, and it's entitled Analysis of Personnel Background, parenthesis NSC. So apparently it's a personnel background of someone who works from the National Security Council. Do you have yes, the sir. document? Yes, sir, I do. Have I correctly identified what that document is? It looks like a document, uh, a memo to Mr. Livingstone, yes, sir. Now, I am informed that we got a copy of this memo from your personal attorney, and it came from your personal records, not from the White House. Is that correct? So this, this uh, is a printout from my computer disk. From your personal computer disk? No, sir, it was a CID computer, and it was the disk, were, disk that I used both at CID and used at the White House, sir. It was but my notes. Your notes that you took home with you, right? I mean, this information didn't come from the White House, is that right? No, sir. The, these are notes from a computer disk that I use. I did not store anything on a hard drive. Did, in other words, then, you took home with you a computer disk with information on it that you gained from the White House. Is that right? Yes, sir. And yes, sir. All right. How much information that you got from working at the White House did you take home with you? How many such documents like number 134, which is an analysis of a personal background uh, file. How many more of these do you have at home? Uh, sir, we made these available to the committee. We made the entire, there were two disks. We made everything available to you, sir. So you're saying now we have every item of information that you took with you from the White House? Uh, everything that was on the computer disk that I used, both. Is there any information that you took from the White House with you when you left that we don't have in this committee? Uh, again, sir, it's, everything was turned over. Everything's here. All right. All right. Mr. Livingstone, you said in your testimony several times that uh, the problem was Mr. Marcisa used the wrong Secret Service list. How do you know, sir, he used the Secret Service list? I believe that, um, as I recall, we had a master secret service list uh, in the vault that, which we all used to determine whether or not people had access to the White House. Did you ever actually see the list upon which Mr. Marcisa ordered these files that are the subject of this hearing? I don't have a specific recollection of that. All right. So. How can you be so sure in your testimony that it was a Secret Service list? You said that three or four times in your testimony. Yes, sir, and I'll be happy to restate it. It was for, is that was the standard practice, sir. When we came to the White House, we were dependent upon the Secret Service. What if standard to practice us wasn't? Who was, I'm sorry, sir, who, was, who had continued access? What, is standard practice, what if standard practice hadn't been followed? I'm sorry, sir? What if standard practice had not been followed? What if another list had been used? You're asking me to guess. I, I can't. Well, but you're stating so surely that a Secret Service list was used. Uh, aren't you guessing when you say it was a Secret Service list? No, sir, I don't think I believe I'm guessing. I, that was our standard practice. All right. Mr. Livingston, what, I have time for one more question. Yes, sir. What is your experience and background in doing sensitive security work uh, by which apparently you were assigned to this very important position in the White House? Gentlemen may answer the question. Sir, um, when, I, when I was hired into the job, it was explained to me um, by several people, including the people that I, that I worked, worked with in the office from the previous administration, that my function was largely an administrative function, that the Secret Service were the primary determiners of a person's, uh, whether or not they were assessed as a security threat, either to the complex or to the principals, um, that counsel would review the documents prior to my ever receiving them to determine suitability. What I was specifically to do was to coordinate the paperwork. Uh, if counsel had an issue that was raised in a background investigation or a tax check waiver, uh, I would contact the individual, for example, uh, it's noted that you haven't filed for your 1993 taxes, why is that? And we would get an answer. If something in the background without being specific, um, a person had moved, uh, they worked in the house and they moved from DC to Virginia and a neighbor had complained they hadn't got the proper license plate, and that was in their background report. I would call them and say, are you aware of this? Could you please straighten it out? I'd get a copy of their new information and then put it in. 
the, the reason I'm explaining this to you in that fashion, sir, is you asked me specifically about my experience. Uh, as, I, as I entered the job, it was largely administrative and not security in nature. I, I have to interrupt at this point because my time has expired, yes, but sir, I believe I understand expired. your answer. Thank you. I yield the gentleman's back. time has expired. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Spratt, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Marseco, Mr. Livingston, Ms. Wetzel, has the committee staff or anyone else shown to you and asked you to identify a document entitled White House Personnel Security Files prior to January 20, 1993? This is a document which is referred to in quotes and caps in paragraph 7 of the responses attached to the letter from the Department of Treasury dated June 19, 1996. Have you seen this list? The copy of the Secret Service memo I have says the list is attached. However, it isn't with what I have. Is anyone connected with the staff shown it to you? Today, no. Or Mr. Marseco? No, sir. So you don't know whether the document represents something you work with or not. But let me take you back through your testimony and start with Mrs. Wetzel. I understand from your statement that you took over project update from Mr. Marseco and from Nancy Schemmel, who, as I understand your testimony, was also working on update. Yes, sometime after Tony left, I took it over. You refer to, quote, Nancy's materials in the vault. You say that these consisted of a Secret Service list and hundreds of FBI forms with Mr. Nussbaum's name printed on them, Xeroxed on them. Uh, you said it was a long list, hundreds of names in alphabetical order that you could identify it as a Secret Service document because it was on distinctive green and white paper. And that looking upon it, you, you, you recognized immediately names from prior administrations. You also found, and I quote, that Nancy had attempted to complete FBI request based upon this particular computer printout. The names corresponded with the sheets that had been typed out, yes. So for these reasons, do you infer, therefore, that Nancy Gemmel was the person who requested this database which you were working with in doing Project Update? I did not work with her list. I threw it out. But, but did that you was the infer original the list that she requested from the Secret Service, yes. Do you know that by any other means an inference? Did you know that because she told you this in the briefing that you held? Is there any other means by which you could link this to her request? She, when she went through jobs that needed to be done, the, left to do in the office before she retired, uh, she did go through the details of the update project, and she showed us where her materials were, and that included that list. So it's your best understanding then that it was her list that was in the vault which everyone was working with in doing project update? I don't know who worked from it. I know that it was her list that was in the vault, and it was from the Secret Service. Okay. Mr. Marseco. Did you request a list of the Secret Service yourself? No, sir. Use that list. Now, the Secret Service says that they have two databases, ePass and WAVES. ePass are for the permanent hard card holders. WAVES is for workers and visitors entry system, which is a much more generalized uh, system. They are kept separately, not commingled. But when a list is requested, as I understand this response, E-Pass is transmitted electronically and downloaded with uh, the WAVES database, and those two databases are then printed out and submitted to your office. Do you understand the difference between E-Pass and WAVES? Did you have that level of understanding and knowledge of their system? Did you know exactly what the computer printout submitted to you consisted of? Both of you, Ms. Wessel, Mr. Marseco. I did not, sir. I just, I did not know. You didn't know the difference? No, sir. Through the course, through the years of my working there, I came to understand that I could give different parameters of information than I needed to the Secret Service. From those parameters, they would produce a list in, the, in a format that I could work with. It was explained to me by the Secret Service at some point that there were two databases, and so I knew I wasn't sure which list came from which database, but I was aware that there were two systems. Now, you say in your testimony there was common knowledge. You knew it. Others knew it, that there were lots of inaccuracies and out-of-date information and names on the Secret Service list. That's correct. 
Can you point to any instances where you called the Secret Service and called to their attention that there were inaccuracies and out-of-date names included? Uh, for the most part, I didn't call them. I wrote memos and kept copies in the office of those memos that I sent to Secret Service saying, delete these people, they're no longer here, or you've got this person under the wrong agency, put them under this agency. Do you know if those memos have been submitted for the record? I haven't seen them. I haven't seen them. Could I ask you, Mr. Chairman, is the list referred to here in paragraph 7 of the responses from Treasury the list entitled White House Personnel Security Files Staff Prior to 12093. Is that a list that this committee staff of, uh, itself prepared or that was prepared by the press and submitted to? Uh, do, do we know what that list is? Mr. Burton said that they deny that this is a list prepared by the Sir? Secret Service, but do we know what the list is that they're referring to? Uh, would the gentleman yield to me? Certainly. Uh, that the li she is correct. The list that uh, is referred to in Section 7 is the list that she typed up. But if you read in Section she, 9, she. that she, she Ms. Wetzel typed up. Okay. But if you'll read Section 9, it explains that it was not possible for them to come up with an outdated list. And they've double-checked their files two or three times and their systems two or three times. And the Secret okay. Service says they cannot come up with an outdated list, which was what these gentlemen said they used. I believe what it says is, to date, have discovered no flaws. It doesn't say that it's not possible. Well, did you prepare this list? Have you seen it to determine whether or not you indeed prepared this list it's referred to here? From the description in that paragraph, I believe it's the list that I typed up. I have not seen a copy of it in front of me now. <clears throat> and what? And what did you use to prepare this? Was this your best take on what were the current pass holders? Were you trying to correct the list when you prepared it? No, that list was prepared when I had gone through all the files that Tony had collected and to my satisfaction had pulled out e every file that I needed. This list I typed up are of all the files I did not need as they were no longer at the White House. This was my archive list that I sent to records management and kept a copy in our office. Gentleman's time Thank has expired. Much. I'm now pleased to recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Mrs. Ross Layton. Thank five. you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as you know, we met here just a week ago to begin our, our inquiry into the matter in which uh, the White House uh, obtained confidential files from the FBI and, more importantly, the use to which these files uh, were put. And the more that we have learned, uh, the greater the concern is from uh, some of the individuals in our, in our committee, for after all, privacy is something that all of us uh, hold very dear to, uh, to our hearts. Twenty-five years ago, uh, our right to privacy was actually put into law, and, and this law requires each of us to give our consent when offices or agencies uh, of the government are requesting information. And the Privacy Act uh, protects our private lives uh, from, uh, uh, from prying. And I'm returning to this theme because I believe that the sensibilities of most Americans have been offended by the actions of uh, the White House uh, operatives. And most of us take for granted those uh, protections afforded to us uh, by the law. We all may have events, happenings, failures in our lives that we would prefer not to have them become public. For, our, for most of us, this would not be a matter of whether it's illegal or illegal. Uh, action or failure on our part. It's simply a desire to keep certain things uh, to ourselves, to protect our children, to protect our families, and to learn that individuals working uh, in the White House uh, uh, in positions were able to use and abuse the, uh, this power with impunity is not only offensive, I think it's uh, rightfully seen as an assault on our own uh, uh, personal sense of, of privacy. And following that theme, uh, Mr. Livingstone, I'd like to ask you if you've ever had a, a full uh, field investigation uh, performed on yourself? Yes, ma'am. And in that uh, preparation for the investigation, were you required to provide some basic uh, data to the investigators, list of addresses, uh, prior employment, any character references? Yes, ma'am. And do you remember signing a form uh, giving authorization for the collection of this information? I don't remember signing it, but... But would you say that that would probably be uh, some sort of standard procedure is the phrase that you've been using before. That would be the standard procedure, but I don't remember signing it. How would you feel if information were made public without your authorization, or even if it was not publicized, was left open 
uh, for anyone to see to make copies of, such as what was going on in the White House, where it was accessible for a number of individuals. We've all heard testimony about college interns and, and files next to copy machines, et cetera. I'll go on to the next question. Thank I don't you. think it's a tough one, but well, I'll let you. I was thinking about it in terms of myself and information that's been put out there about myself. Uh, so I, I can speak to that. Uh, I, I would, if in fact that's why we did it, and it isn't, I would, would think that would be egregious. But I know this information was not misused, ma'am. <laughs> did you ever tell anyone, Mr. Livingston, that you had read their background files or knew personal information uh, about them in a manner that... Uh, it might be interpreted by that individual, might be interpreted that you could use this information against them or uh, at some time in the future? As a course of my job, ma'am, it was very common for me on a daily basis to talk with individuals about information in their background. Do you think that some might have gotten the impression that some information might have been used uh, or could be used against them? Um, I would hope not. Did you ever request uh, written authorization from these individuals uh, prior to making the request to the FBI? And, and if so, did you, did you keep a copy of those, uh, uh, of those who had signed the form? I'm sorry, ma'am. There was talking behind me. I couldn't hear your first Sorry. Did you, ever request, uh, did you ever request written authorization from those individuals prior to making the request uh, to the FBI? And if so, did you uh, keep a record of those uh, uh, who had signed the form? Are you asking me for the standard Form 86, which is what personnel and staff fill out, which is sent to the FBI? Correct. Uh, it was standard procedure in our office. Uh, uh, Mr. Nussbaum and, and previous, excuse me, succeeding counsels all required uh, a waiver form to be signed uh, by the individual authorizing the White House to send that information to the FBI. And did you uh, tell these individuals that you would seek their uh, FBI files prior to finalizing their, their clearances? I'm sure that was understood, ma'am. But you don't, wouldn't consider that what you say standard procedure? You say that it would be well, understood? No, ma'am. No, I, I'd like to answer that question specifically. It states in the waiver that you are authorizing White House counsel or, or its agent and again, I'm speaking from memory here, but uh, to send the attached forms for review to, for a background investigation to be completed on you by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and that its re contents will be returned to counsel. As you know, there have been some reports in the media, in print and in, on, uh, in uh, other media that uh, you had, in fact, shared some information with some individuals about their about their backgrounds or something that was in their files. Were you ever rebuked or, or talked to in the administration uh, uh, referring to your knowledge of people's background? Last week, for example, it was on CNN that, that in fact, uh, uh, you had discussed the files with some individuals, and I'm wondering what happened in the administration if anyone knew that you had used those files. Well, I think it's important to speak in the context of my three and a half years at the White House and the um, thousands, if not uh, tens of thousands of people that I worked with. Um, as I've stated earlier, um, and as you well know, um, uh, when I started on the job, a lot of it was uh, on the job training. And uh, early on, um, uh, it was pointed out to me by a Miss Evelyn Lieberman um, that in fact some uh, staffer had suggested to her that I had in some way offended someone by mentioning something to them. Do you think that that could be the individual referred to in that CNN uh, spot when they said that you, someone in the administration had talked to you about your use of the files? Uh, I'm trying to answer your question with, <coughs> with the knowledge as best as I have it, ma'am. To answer your question, yes, I, I did have a staffer discuss with me um, that a, a, a separate staffer was upset with the way that I had um, talked to her about some information in her background. Would uh, you say that you were rebuked by someone in the administration? And when you say talk to, 
the, in, this individual talk to you about it to say my, that you had done something wrong? My specific recollection is that we talked about it in the hallway. The gentleman's gentlelady's time Talked about expired. it in the hallway. But... Gentlelady's time has expired. I would now recognize the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Slaughter, for five minutes. Thank you very much. Ms. Wetzel, the list that you were just given that we've all only seen for the first time, yes. am I correct that that is a list that you were trying to call out? This was a, yes, this was I a list that you this, created yourself. These are the files that I archived with records management. It had nothing to do with Secret Service list except you were taking these names off. Right. Uh, I think that's very important for us to get on the record here since the indication seems to be the Secret Service had done this for you. Let me ask a couple of questions about this. Is it true that you were trying to recreate files because the Bush administration had taken them all and you were responsible for trying to put some of this together? Yes. Uh, is that common? Do all administrations go off and take all those lists with them? That's what I was told. Well, that sure is a silly thing, isn't it? Maybe we ought to look at that. Another thing is I'm very curious as to why in the world you stopped at the letter G. These are the files that, that I had come across after Tony left, mm -hmm. that I was led to believe that they were Tony's. We called them Tony's files that he had ordered, and he had only gotten through G. So and once I pulled all the files I needed out of that group, I archived the rest, and he had only gotten through the and letter G. And nobody ever went beyond the letter G. Oh. That's the end of the list, to the letter uh, G. The end of this list, yes. All right. Um, now, there's been a lot of talk about all this lying around. I, I, tell me, who had access to this vault? Uh, Everybody in the White House just walked in and walked oh in? Oh, no. Oh, no. When Did you keep a log of uh, at people who wanted to take these files out and look at them? I'm sorry, a log? Was, was yes. there any, in, did they have to get permission, do anything at all to go see these files? The files were not taken out of uh, the office without signing a log, yes. Do you have any... Uh, is that log available? Has that been handed over? I haven't Did seen anybody it. sign them out? I'm sorry, can anybody? Oh, no. My, no, no, no. Did anybody? My understanding is that after those things were put in the vault, they were almost never seen again. And this group of moved. files, to my knowledge, were never taken out of the office. Other working files would occasionally, White House counsel would need them. When they were taken to White House counsel, they would be signed out in a log, but not these files. So it is not accurate to say that these files were available to anybody who wanted to come in there and look at those records. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Um, there, there, I want to talk a minute about uh, the uh, fact that they did stop at the letter G. I mean, that, I have to find that's the most intriguing thing in the world I've ever known. Did you only did you want information on people whose names went up to G? Or what the world? That, that's really a strange thing. It doesn't sound to me like a nefarious plot. To, uh, unless you think that everybody who's bad is a letter, under letter G, and that's okay with me because my name starts with S. But I don't, I, for the life of me, I can't really understand that part of it, and I don't know how anybody can make some sort of mysterious, nefarious, un underhanded kind of thing out of this. Can, can you explain that? Well, it was my understanding that that's how far Tony got and his detail and Tony ended, quit. and that was it. Okay. Did Tony quit because he thought there was no point in this, or we don't know? Oh, no, he didn't quit. His detail ended with our office, mm -hmm. and that was, that was it. And so let me recap here a little bit. You had no files left. And I can remember quite specifically there was a terrible flap about people working in the White House every day who didn't have the proper clearance. Right. And there was a great push on, and the papers were crazy about this, and who in the world is going in our White House, and, and they don't have the clearance. And so... Uh, somebody decided they better get these files because you didn't have any and try to recreate the, what the FBI had said about all these people. And yet you stopped at the letter G, put it in a vault where, to your knowledge, nobody ever took them out. Right. Well, that seems pretty simple to me. I, don't, I you know, maybe uh, just a country girl from New York uh, just has kind of grasped <laughs> this. But for the life of me, uh, okay, Kentucky. But I can't for the life of me understand why in the world suddenly this turns out to be such an outrageous thing. Uh, particularly when we had White Houses in the past that had Ollie North in the basement. I mean, you know, I, let's, let's face it. Um, I, we had, Mr. Nussbaum, let me say one thing before I ask you this question. As a fellow New Yorker, I know you to be one of the finest legal minds and one of the finest people in the United States, and it embarrasses me to see you here today. But I want to tell you that former counsels to the White House said last week that it was commonplace 
for people use the, the sending out those recommendations for information without the council ever knowing about it. Do you know that to be true? Yes, I know. I read the hearings last week, too, and that, that is the truth. What possible reason, then, could this committee have to say that suddenly you did something that was totally out of order when four previous councils had said that's the way it's always been done? Have you pondered why you were in this spot? <laughs> well, we tried to, when I went into the White House, I met with Mr. Gray and Mr. Schmidt, Vince Foster and I met with the two of them. They briefed us on the basic procedures. They were quite cooperative uh, in trying to help us uh, get a handle on these kind of things. Then we brought Mr. Kennedy in uh, to work with us on this thing. And what we try to do, as the Congresswoman suggested, is, is basically follow the procedures that were followed in the prior administration. We had a great crush of work because it was a new administration, a Democratic administration replacing a public administration. But basically, we were trying to follow the same procedures. And I think, by and large, we did. On the other hand, this was an egregious error that was made uh, in, on the lower levels of the White House. And we are responsible for that error. And I am apologetic about it. And I, I feel terrible about it. And that's the reason I guess I'm here. I guess I deserve to be here. Do you, do you agree, though, these procedures ought to be changed? There's, there's no reason to do it this way anymore. Well, in view well, of the... You know, let me ask you something else. Why should these FBI files be in a presidential library somewhere? I mean, I think a lot more people have access to that than out of a vault at the White House, wouldn't they? I think you have a good point. But I, I find that a very peculiar thing. Suddenly, we've never worried about presidents walking off and taking all these FBI files with them. That's well, never been brought up before, I take it. Not to my knowledge. Well, I would certainly like to see that this White House would change that. I, I find, frankly, the most dangerous thing I find that I've learned here is that those things are available out there all over the United States in anybody's warehouse or in anybody's library. If there's ever an information, uh, you know, blackmail to find out information, I think they'd be far more likely to do that than in your vault. They weren't available to everybody, as Ms. Wetzel just... As, and as I understand well, it, nobody took them. The gentlelady has Thank expired. You. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New Hampshire, Mr. Zeloff, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, ask unanimous consent uh, to include my opening statement in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Um, Mr. Kennedy, why did uh, uh, Mr. Livingstone personally ask for Mr. Marcisa to be detailed to the office of uh, the White House Security? I think because he thought Mr. Marcisa would be a good assistance to him. And. Uh, in your letters to then Secretary of Defense Les Aspen, you requested uh, Mr. Marcisa and spoke of his unique talents. Uh, who informed you of those capabilities? Well, Craig had, had indicated to me that he, he could particularly use assistance in dealing with the quite numerous members of the military that have access to the White House complex, and that he thought that Tony's Army, Inves Army investigative background would be of assistance in that area. That's 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 uh, pretty much the the whole of it. I mean, he strictly just the army. I, I think I don't understand your question, sir. Okay, the in terms of uh, his talents, his talents pretty much represented those relative relative to the military. Well, I mean, he said he said Tony was a good hand. Okay. Um, Mr. Nussbaum, did you know of the special detailing request by name uh, to work in the personnel security office? No. You did not. Um, so you did not authorize it? No, I, didn't, I did not authorize it in any specific fashion. Obviously, Mr. Kennedy had my general authority to do what he thought was best in running that side of our operation. I had great confidence in his, as I said in my opening statement, in his skill, in his judgment, in his integrity. And I still do, sir, to this day. So Mr. Kennedy then had ultimate authority for that? He had authority delegated from me, yes. Okay. Con Congressman, I did not discuss Mr. Marsika's hiring with, uh, uh, with Bernie. I did not. The gentleman yield is just to me for one question. Yes, sir. Mr. Nussbaum, were you aware that in all of the previous administrations, no detailee had ever been brought into the White House to do this kind of review of very sensitive background material. Uh, no, I was not aware of that one, one way or the other. But I think we faced, look, obviously I'm sorry what happened happened, but we faced a special problem, as I indicated before. We had staff cuts and not enough people to do the job, and at the same time we had a huge number of security clearances to process. And that, I think, explains what happened here. 
If we had to do it all over again, obviously, we would do it differently. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll yield the balance of my time to you, but let me just ask one question. Didn't most of those staff cups come out of the drug office? No, they were generally all throughout the White House, Congressman. I mean, a, a, a good deal, a good deal came out of the drug office, that's true, but they're all over the White House. We, we, were, we were terribly pressed in the council's office. Mr. Mr. Marcis, uh, the gentleman yielded his time to me. Mr. Marcis, uh, uh, you indicated uh, in ter earlier testimony that, that when you came to the White House, you were directed to undertake this project. Who directed you to do that? Um, I've received my directions from Mr. Livingstone, Mr. Mr. Livingstone. Chairman. Uh, and Mr. You got there because, as I understand it, Mr. Livingstone talked to Mr. Kennedy, uh, recommended you for this position as a detailee to undertake uh, this reviewing of these files. Is that correct, Mr. Kennedy? Yes, Craig, Craig wanted Tony to come. And uh, as a result of that, you were brought over. Mr. Uh, Arcisa, at the end in February of 1994, uh, you concluded your first six months assignment. It is my understanding that a request was pending, a request was submitted to extend your service at the White House for an additional six months. Is that correct? Well, at that time, Congressman, I didn't realize that at that very, at that time, I found out later on that there, th in fact, I didn't know until I saw a letter when I was interviewed by your counsel that, uh, that I had uh, been re-requested. That's the first I actually saw the document. As far as you would have been concerned, though, you had, you had gone A through G on this particular file. You had also, during that period, however, uh, reviewed other files, uh, as you now have uh, indicated and given us the information, that you reviewed a substantial number of files involving National Security Council personnel, both, uh, uh, both staff and uh, appointees. Is that correct? Re I reviewed everybody's. Which was not an A to G list. But I'm, I'm sorry. You had completed the review of the A to G list for the White House staff, is that correct? No, sir. The, uh, if I understand your question, you said A to G, I reviewed A to G. Uh, a and then to you G, left. Pardon me? And then you left. But what that, what that is, A to G, was just the staff list, Congressman. I understand. But then you left, right? Uh, I left at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, Gentlemen, yeah. I would now yield uh, to the gentleman from Indiana for two questions. Let me uh, just, I think it's very important to clarify this. In, in Section 9 of the letter from the Secret Service, it says, both supervisory and technical experts familiar with our EPAS system are unaware of any flaws which would cause an outdated list to be produced. Now, we're talking about people from a previous administration, and they said it's, they did not believe it was capable for them to produce that outdated list. They went on to say, we continue to examine all aspects of the Secret Service passholder database and access control systems and to date have discovered no flaws which would result in a database generating printouts containing outdated information. So the Secret Service does not believe they produced this list from which the 700 names came. Now, I would like to have the committee put on the docket at some future date uh, uh, one more item. I received a letter from the uh, I, from the FBI today, and they said, and I'll make this available to everybody on the committee, it said one folder in the box was identified as IRS returned March, April 1993. This folder contains five sheets of paper, each entitled IRS reports returned. Each of these sheets of paper bears the names of numerous individuals and notations as to whether reports are complete or incomplete. This would lead one to believe there may have been some IRS uh, audits or tax returns sent to the White House, and I would like for us to pursue that, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, if uh, these are important objection. allegations. Are we, could we at least have the FBI come in front of us to explain these kinds of things? We're just tossing them out there for public speculation, and, and we don't know whether that's concerning the update list request. or what I, I am making that, that request of the committee. I am making sure. that request. He's of making that request of the committee. Now, I'm, the gentleman's time has expired, and I now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kanjorski, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me try and put this in a little bit in context. How many files in the course of a four-year term of the president would, be, would the personnel security office be called upon to examine? Sorry, who are you asking? Yes, well, yourself me? or Mr. Livingstone, if he knows. 
I'm sorry, sir. I was making some notes. I, I, I can okay, I can answer you, on if you will, Ms. Winslow. To my knowledge, thousands. Th thousands, and those thousands of files would represent the full-time personnel of what we call the White House complex of approximately 1,900 people. Other detailees, such as Mr. McCarthy, McCasey, that come in from all agencies to make up for the shortfall of slots available at the White House for work to be performed that we're all aware of, but at this committee today pretend ignorance that uh, the White House does not staff itself through the other executive agencies of the government to the tunes of hundreds and sometimes thousands of people. Those people would, because they have access to the White House, would be subject to examination. Is that correct? Yes. And then there would be those people who would be on the normal list of visitors, either to the President's office or to high officials' office, that would have ready access to the White House. Is that correct? Appointments were not handled by our office. Not, not, uh, in other words, if someone who was a friend of the President mm -hmm. and would have ready access to his office, that would not come through your office. Is that correct? Not that I know of. If I could speak to that. Yes. If you it, Precisely, if you're saying ready access, meaning there is an access list, yes, they, they would. We would. Surely, Dick Morris has a file down there to check he's not going to knock the president off if he walks in one day, right? Sir? I mean, we see him down there almost every day. So clearly, his file, he's been cleared by the personnel security. I can't speak as of today, but in my tenure at the White House, Mr. Morris did not have a file with us at the White House. Did nor, not have a file. Nor was he ever on access or had a pass. All right, it's just that he would have to call ahead like any of us would call ahead that we're coming and give our clearances as of that date. Is that correct? Well, I'll say within a week of me leaving, that was, would be correct for Mr. Morris. Okay. Now, in the course of a year, then, thousands of names, and particularly would start at the beginning of the term because that's when you had to reconstruct the files that were missing from the prior administration. So thousands of files from the FBI would come over, be checked, and then be put into the vault. Is that correct? They would never be sent back to the FBI. As I understand it, no files once sent from the FBI that came to the White House were ever returned to the FBI. Is that correct? Sir, I'm glad you asked that question. The only information that I ever got, and I can't speak for the rest of the people here, of course, the only information I ever got about what we were to do with FBI files was to safeguard them, ensure that they were remanded to records management at the end of the administration. I can attest to many instances when I got early in the administration investigations that were ongoing under Mr. C. Boyden Gray sent to our office to C. Boyden Gray and the FBI knew full well months into the administration C. Boyden Gray wasn't the counsel anymore and very often we would realize that these people had either separated or chose to leave or whatever they decided to do, retire perhaps. And all we ever did with those files is we safeguarded and we stored them and perhaps now they're in archives. But it was a standard procedure, sir, and it's very important. This. We were never instructed to return materials back to the FBI. It was always a one-way street. It got to your office, and right. you were charged to put them in the vault, keep them maintained. Sir, if I could be specific, um, often, not very often, but often we would get, for John D. Smith, we would get John S. Smith's report sent to us by mistake by the FBI. Now, that we would send back to the FBI if we knew that we were requesting John D. Smith versus John S. Smith, assuming they had no, no business ever at the White House. Okay, Mr. I'm going to talk to Mr. Nussbaum for a second because I noticed our chairman and members of the committee on the other side were shocked, shocked, Mr. Nussbaum, that your name is printed on a form and sent to the FBI and that triggers something. There's no member of Congress that would ever allow anything to go out of their office that they personally had their name on that they weren't fully responsible for and knew the entire content. Oh, for that would ever happen. That would never happen on the Hill. You know that, don't you, Mr. Yes, sir. I'm delighted to hear that. <laughs> you know, Mr. Nosbaum, that probably every congressional office on this Hill has a thousand pieces of correspondence or other material per day that leaves that the member of Congress never sees and relies on the good sense of his staff to have put a filtering process into place that he periodically checks that sends that material out under his name printed or in many instances signature appearing like it was his original work. Is that correct? That's correct. So that was the procedure in the White House Counsel's Office under my tenure and under the prior tenures of other counsel before me. That's how I understood it and now and I know that to be so, sir. 
Now, to close this up, I, I do have to say, I, you're starting to persuade me that this is a gigantic goof <laughs> of gigantic proportions in terms of how it did impact on the right of privacy of people and perhaps uh, allowing FBI records to expose. But incredibly, I'm beginning to think and listening to the five witnesses, Mr. Chairman, that in fact, uh, as I understand the testimony, and correct me now, anyone from the table, to your knowledge, you've sworn under oath, none of this information that came in under these FBI folders was ever sent to a level above you outside the normal course for what it was intended for, and specifically never for political purposes, and that none of you ever transmitted or communicated any of this information to the President of the United States, to the President's wife, to the Chief of Staff of the President of the United States, to any members of the Cabinet of the President of the United States, or any of the high officials of the White House. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. That's and correct. No, no that's political it. operatives on the Democratic Committee expired. or anyone involved therein? Gentleman's time has That's expired. correct. That's correct. And uh, I would now just note that there seems to me there is a difference between uh, staff doing letters to constituent mail and, and getting into FBI files. But with that, I would now recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. McHugh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Marsega, probably most importantly, sir, how do you pronounce your last name? <laughs> Thank you. It's Marcisa. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Mr. Marcisa. Prior to uh, your coming to the White House, uh, prior to uh, Mr. Kennedy asking Secretary Aspen for you to be detailed, uh, d uh, did you have an opportunity to discuss what you might be doing where that uh, request for your detail be granted with uh, Mr. Livingstone? Uh, yes, sir. I talked to him uh, about uh, giving me the opportunity to work in the White House. And more than that, what did Mr. Livingstone suggest to you might be your task if uh, you were able to work that out? Uh, Mr. Livingstone suggested that it was not investigative uh, type activity, that it was um, clerical, administrative reviewing uh, backgrounds. Uh, he said that, um, as I recall, he said that uh, the fact that I had a top secret clearance might help in the, in the detail but that it, uh, he reminded me that it would not be uh, in line with what I do as, normally for the Army. And what do you normally do for the Army, sir? I'm a special agent in the Criminal Investigation Division and I um, investigate procurement fraud. Who told you, as I understand from your statements and things that I have read in the newspaper, who ordered you and requested that you report any derogatory information that you may file in the course of your reviewing, uh, or you may discover in the course of reviewing these files? So I was briefed that I, by Mr. Livingstone and I believe Ms. Gimmel, that, I, that the Clinton administration wanted a higher level of, uh, of review on people who were working in the White House, and I looked for various uh, things that might raise to the level of concern. So that, that is relatively investigative in nature, though, is it not? I mean, to, to peruse files and do background checks and make a determination as to what is derogatory and what is not, is that not part of investigation? Sir, I didn't do background checks. I reviewed the documents. Uh, it was rather boring, but I reviewed them. I was Beyond glad to have the opportunity the, is, also. What you, the boring things you did, were they not investigative? Uh, no, so they were, I would say, review. Okay. Uh, why did it, from my perspective, and if the reason I'm asking is if there's an explanation, I'd like to hear it. Why did it take so long between the time when all of this became evident until now for you to release the data on the additional 300 files that we've now learned about? What, what was your thought process there? And I'll wait for your attorney to... to Sir, I got a letter. My attorney got a letter from you yesterday, and we, we took care of it. I mean, it, it, and prior to that time, it never crossed your mind that perhaps we ought to come forward and present everything so there's no implication that this is just a, a Chinese water torture of cover-up? Because I, I have to tell you, that's what it looks like. Uh, Congressman, these uh, materials were fully produced to other investigative agencies. And to, wh to whom, sir? Well, can I? One moment, please. Certainly. Uh, to the Office of Independent Counsel, sir. What, what was the date of that uh, submission? Yesterday. It 
approximately uh, 10 days ago. To within the past two, about two weeks ago was the first time that we were involved in the matter. Mr. Chairman, while uh, we're... Uh, Mr. Yeah, Congressman, yes. I, I believe there was, uh, it was consulting. I don't want to make any errors here. I believe that uh, they were first alerted to the fact that there was a f that I had disc uh, over a week, week and a half ago. As soon as we discovered it, my attorney notified um, um, this, the uh, Whitewater. As soon committee. as you discovered it, um, uh, would you like me to walk that sequence through on how I discovered it? On how you discovered you had discs? Um, my my first day that I met with my attorney, the first day I was served with a grand jury subpoena and I had a 45 minute interview with my attorney and after that interview he asked me, do you have any notes of any meetings I, with Ms. Kimball? And, he, and, I, and that's where it started. Okay, so prior to that time it never occurred to you that this w might be important? Well, I was unaware that I had those files, sir. I had investigative files on those same disks and I, and I had those in my at my place of work, and I was unaware that, that those documents existed okay. until right. he asked me to check. All right, thank you. Uh, last uh, week when Mr. Gray testified, he responded to some of my inquiries that, and, and the inquiries of others, that the FBI had contacted OPS and had told them that in relation to many of the files that you were requesting, nor, uh, that is to say the inappropriately uh, garnered files, that no name checks were being done. And Mr. Gray asserted and the FBI has testified that that should have served as an alarm bell to you that something, if not inappropriate, very unusual is occurring here. Do you recall the FBI ever reaching out and making that kind of statement? Um, I don't understand what OPS is. Could you clarify Office what that is? Office of Personnel Services, where you were working. And, and they did what, sir? I'm sorry. They contacted the White House, your office, Mr. Livingstone's office, as, uh, and said in response to the numbers of files that you were requesting that no name checks in association with those requested files were being done. It was the FBI's interpretation, also Mr. Gray's interpretation, that that condition where you were just bringing over files wholesale without doing the necessary and attendant name checks behind them should have indicated to you or anyone who was involved in the process that something unusual, if not inappropriate, but at least unusual, was occurring. I don't want to burn up your time. Could I talk to my attorney? I don't understand your question. Well, I, let me withdraw that. Mr. Livingstone, any time did you ever meet with the FBI uh, in, in any way uh, with respect to the, this process and the files being requested by your office from them? I don't recall, but to try and be helpful, I do recall early in the administration talking about workload, but not specifically uh, these reports, sir. So you did meet with the FBI? No, I didn't say I met with the FBI. I, I said I think gentlemen. I recall discussing with the FBI about workload. I regret to tell the gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I now recognize the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Sanders, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, let me just briefly describe the dilemma that I'm having today, and I think maybe many other people are having as well. First, I am aware, and I know you are aware, of an April 23rd memo from the House Republican leadership to all full and subcommittee chairmen, and it states, and I quote, Quote, on behalf of the House leadership, we have been asked to call all committees for information that you already have on three subjects listed below. We are compiling information for packaging and presentation to the leadership for determining the agenda. You are a tremendous source for this project. The subjects are waste, fraud, and abuse in the Clinton administration, influence of Washington labor union bosses, corruption, examples of dishonesty or ethical lapses in the Clinton administration, end of quote, etc. In other words, what we are aware of, some of us may be aware of, that there's a presidential election coming. One or two of us may be aware of it. It's a hard-fought election. And some of us are concerned about the enormous amount of partisanship which is taking place all over the Congress. I know that in a couple of weeks there is, in fact, going to be a hearing on labor unions who are actively involved in this campaign and so forth and so on. And that concerns me. It concerns me very much. Having said that, and my concern about the nature of the partisanship, let me also 
say that I would uh, want to express my belief that what we are discussing here is, in fact, a very serious matter. I believe very, very strongly that all, uh, all Americans, including those of us who are public officials elected or in the administrative uh, positions, have a right to privacy and that it is an outrage, an absolute outrage, that possibly derogatory information that individuals would not want to be read by anyone not needing that information for security purposes could fall into the wrong hands. And clearly the White House handling of this whole situation has been a disaster. This information contains very personal matters, medical information, credit history, and interviews with family members and close friends that public officials, whether they're Republican, Democrat, or in my case, an independent, have a right to be kept confidential and out of the wrong hands because we don't want individuals to be hurt. We don't want individuals' personal matters to be used for any political purposes. Now, having said that, let me ask Mr. Nussbaum a question because this thing goes around and around. What all of us understand is that we do not want individuals, innocent individuals, to have their life history exposed to people who should not have that history. We don't want good people to be defamed. Now, I've been in and out because I've had other matters today, and I may have missed this, but Mr. Nussbaum, when you testified earlier, you indicated uh, that the Associated Press ran a story based on a press conference that I believe Mr. Klinga had. And I'm looking at your testimony and from the AP story, and the AP story says, quote, U.S. Representative William Klinga, Republican Pennsylvania, suggested the written request might be a false statement that could be prosecuted as a felony, end of quote from the AP story. Mr. Nussbaum, are you a felon? Now, when we talk about derogatory information, when we talk about hurting innocent people, it goes all over the place. So you have, it has been suggested in a national press story that you are a felon. You have worked for the government for how many years in public service? Well, I worked as counsel to the president for a year and a half, and then I, I worked as assistant United States attorney in the Southern District of New York as a federal prosecutor in the early 1960s under, under Robert Morgenthau and Bob Kennedy. I also worked for the Congress of the United States on the impeachment inquiry of Richard Nixon as a senior associate let special me just, counsel under John Doyle. Thank you. And my question is, how do you feel when you read an AP story that goes coast to coast after years of public service that some activity of yours might, that you could be prosecuted uh, as a felon? How do you feel about that? I expressed to Representative Klinger just how I felt about that. And that's why I asked him for an apology, which I still haven't gotten. Mr. Klinger, Mr. Chairman, would you want to, I mean, we are all concerned legitimately that innocent people, Republicans, could have honest information about their lives going into the wrong hands. I share that. That is an outrage. But would you possibly agree that a national AP story would suggest that this man, after years of public service, might be a felon is also unfortunate? Might I just suggest that the document you're referring to was one document. We now know that there, there were hundreds of documents that were being sent out. That document obviously raised a lot of suspicions because it was to request the files for Billy Ray Dale who at that time was be under observation as I'm aware he was of that. a felon. But you, you're familiar with the AP story, and here's a man, I mean, like the Republicans, hard-working public servants, work hard enough, we, we have all have enough problems not to be called the possible felon. Does he deserve an apology? Mr. Mr. Chairman, that was... I have said I would let, let the documents speak for themselves, and I think that uh, the, the concern I have here is that we've got a lot of effort made to sort of indicate that Mr. Marcisa and Mr. Livingstone we're solely responsible for this. I would suggest that Mr. Nussbaum and others who allowed this climate uh, to exist in the White House are Maybe. equally culpable. Maybe. And ignorance and doing a bad job is one thing. But, you know, suggesting that somebody might be a, a felon after years of public service is, you will agree, a very different thing. I never accused Mr. Nussbaum of being a felon. I said that if, in fact, this was true, that this went out with his knowledge, and it was for, a, for a, an erroneous request, for access for Billy Ray Dale, that that was a false statement. Yeah, but that's a lot of ifs. Mr. Nussbaum, would you want to respond to that? Mr. Chairman, that is a reckless falsehood. And all you had to do, sir, is pick up the phone and ask me, did I know about this request for Billy Dale's files? May you, I say to you, Mr. Nussbaum, we have tried to call you in the past, but we find that it's very difficult the, to get through the echelons of, uh, Mr. of individuals to get to you. Rep, no, Representative Klinger, I am now... I now have even a more exalted position than when I had in the White House. I am now a private citizen. It's very easy now to get through me. You call my office, if, especially you, Mr. Representative Clinton, you could get through instantly. 
You got through to Billy Dale, but you never got through to me. My, I would take uh, back Mr. my time. Mr. Mr. Chairman, may I make a parliamentary inquiry? I'd let me, the gentleman will state as parliamentary inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for my own advocation, the status of the witnesses here I think is important for this moment, the understanding. Uh, is Mr. Nussbaum here uh, appearing under subpoena or by his own will? Mr. Nussbaum is appearing under subpoena. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the only point that I wanted to make is, is this is a difficult process for all of us. I think there have been some serious problems that we want to get to the root of. I think we are also aware that there is a campaign going on as well. And some of us at least do not want to see this thing become extraordinarily partisan. And just as we do not want to see innocent public officials who, used to, who are Republicans, who serve this country to the best of their ability, have personal information about them being used in a disparaging way. There, so is, we, a, there is a campaign going on, and time is also going on, and yours has expired. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Horn, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me just ask a few simple questions first of Mr. Livingston. Uh, in terms of that vault, where was the Xerox machine in relation to the vault? Is it in the vault, outside the vault? I know it's a stand-up vault, is it not? Well, if I can try to answer your, your question part by part. Um, the room that we operated in in 1983 was one standalone room which had a, a stand-up or as you called a standalone vault attached to it. Um, so where is the Xerox machine in relation to the vault? The Xerox machine would be located in the office, which is adjoining the vault. How many feet from the vault is it? It's your standard office, okay. probably 20 by 20. All right. In interns did go in and out of the vault. Is that not correct? Yes, sir. And usually what we do with interns often is have them do the dirty jobs that nobody wants to do, which is go use the Xerox machine. So it's possible a lot of interns use the Xerox machine at the direction of somebody in your office, right? Interns did use the Xerox machine. Okay, well, if I were an intern and I suspect and saw such intriguing names on a list as James Baker, and I think I would know if I was a college intern that he had been Secretary of State, isn't there a likelihood that intern might well have Xerox some parts of that file, since here's a major figure in American politics and diplomacy? You're asking me to guess, and I can't do that. What I can restate, sir, is that we stress the importance in both a briefing with the interns and require them to attend a security briefing, which all White House staff do, the importance of handling and not handling materials, which they don't have a need to know. Yeah, well, it seems to me it's a pretty sloppy setup. Uh, what uh, intrigues me here is the sort of what I call the apologies strategy. Uh, it's a method of operation that I find the Clinton White House using, whether it's the president apologizing to a group for increasing taxes or people apologizing for these seeming bureaucratic snafus. Now, uh, it just seems to me there's an assumption here that we Americans, the American people, are just so forgiving that once you apologize, we'll forget everything. And I guess I don't buy that assumption, so let me ask you a few questions. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, uh, did uh, Mrs. Clinton or Vice President Gore recommend you for the uh, council position you held in the White House? Mrs. Clinton probably had some involvement in it, yes, sir. Did the Vice President have involvement? Not to my knowledge. Okay. But since you were part of the Rose Law Firm, you'd assume Mrs. Clinton certainly had some role in that. I would assume so. Well, let me ask all of you, and I think Mr. Nussbaum, you also were an old friend of the Clinton family, as I remember, and certainly your position was partly due to their knowledge of you over the years, as I've read. Is that correct? I worked with Mrs. Clinton on the impeachment inquiry, and I, right. I don't think we were close personal friends with her or the president, but I did know them over the years, yes. Well, what I'm uh, curious now is, Mr. Marcisa and uh, Mr. Livingstone, uh, did Vice President Gore or Mrs. Clinton recommend you for the position you held, Mr. Livingstone, to your knowledge? I have no knowledge of that. You have no knowledge of it. And Mr. Marcisa, uh, do you have any awareness of either Mrs. I highly Clinton doubt or Vice it, President sir. Gore? Okay. How about Mr. Carville? Did he recommend either one of you for a position? Did you get to know him, Mr. Livingstone, in the campaign? I don't believe Mr. Carville at that time knew who I was. Okay. How about you, Mr. Marcisa? I don't believe he had any involvement in my 
getting the detail at all. Okay. Let me put to each one of you, have you been offered a position in the public or private sector by anyone in the White House who's either an agent, a friend, or a relative of the President, the Vice President, or any member of the executive branch to say as little as you possibly can in this hearing or related hearings? Has anyone offered you that position in the private sector or the public sector if, in brief, you keep quiet? Is so that direct question directed at me? It's directed right now. Absolutely down. not. Okay. Sorry. The answer is no from you. How about you, Mr. Kennedy? Has anybody offered me a job to keep quiet? Is yeah, that the essence right. of your question? Yeah, because some have said, gee, I can't remember or something, and I'm just curious. Congressman, I have a job. Okay. Uh, you don't want another one, I guess. <laughs> you, Mr. Livingstone? Is the question, has somebody Has anybody asked me related to the White House, the President, promised a position in private service? Absolutely not. Or public service? If I, if not at the risk of sounding rude, and I don't mean to be rude, but I did resign today. Yeah, no, I understand that. But sometimes people, even the travel gate that they fired, they tried to place them around the administration when the heat got a little tough. So I'm curious. Ms. Witzel? No. And Mr. Nussbaum, you're happy in that New York. That would be a reprehensible and criminal act, and I don't believe anyone in the Clinton White House would do such a thing, sir. Well, glad to hear it. Glad Congressman, to hear the it. Sure. The Congressman, the answer to your question in my, is no for me as well. Okay. Uh, now, Mr. Livingston, did you... Re uh, and, and Mr. Marcisic, too. Did you remove Kerry or were in any way, well, this is to Mr. Livingston, did you remove Kerry or were in any way involved in the removal of papers from the office of White House counsel, associate counsel, Vince Foster? That allegation has been made. Were you involved in the removal of papers from that office after his tragic death? I'm sorry, you're going to have to make your question All right. just a little more Did you help move any documents from the office of Vincent Foster after his death. We know various White House aides were in the room perusing documents, denying them to the United States Park Police. Were you one of those who either was called to help remove documents or any way from the Foster office? I have no knowledge of anyone removing documents, no knowledge of anyone being asked or myself being asked, and I okay. did not myself remove documents immediately following Mr. Foster's death. Yeah, the gentleman's it's time has expired, fine. and I had hoped that we could break when we had, had our next Mr. series Chairman. of votes. However, I'm advised that we're not going to have votes until about 3 o'clock. I understand also we may have a medical situation here, and I don't want to exacerbate uh, that situation, so I'm now going to Mr. recess Chairman, the hearing point. until uh, 10 minutes of 3, and hopefully we will not have votes till 4. Mr. Chairman, an inquiry before you do? Yes. Mr. Chairman, you had offered for the record certain documents. I wanted to make an inquiry whether the document from uh, Gregory Meacham to uh, a, a gentleman by the name TKUBIC dated Monday, September 26th, was offered and accepted in the record. It's the, uh, the documents that were made a part of the record were, that was the email record, that's right, and that was made a part was, of the record. Then, Mr. Chairman, based on the, the disclosure of that information, I make the request, the unanimous consent request, that the following documents, the letter to Janet Reno dated June 11, 1996, from uh, Congressman Collins, that we will, the prosecution I think memo of August 10, 1994, for Billy Dale, that the decline memo of January 11, 1996, from Harry Tomlinson and Darnell Matterns, that the decline memo of April 5, 1996, for Dale Martins and Harry Tomlinson, and the indictment schedule of August 15, 1994, for Billy Dale, all be printed and made part of the permanent record. We'll reserve judgment on that unanimous in consent request, so we've had a chance to review the documents, and the committee stands adjourned. Yeah. yeah, I'm coming. I'm going to try to get out of here. Stand up three. Do you want to The second portion of this hearing will air tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern Time here on...